April 18th workshop to order. Um, we do have two commissioners that um, are stuck in traffic, so. Um, one made it. One made it, okay. Well, oh yes, he did. Good to see you, Charlie. Um, <laughs> Commissioner Flowers, uh, horrible, horrible accident, car cut in two. She's stuck in that traffic jam, so she'll be here when she can, safely, hopefully. Um, but we'll get started with, um, Chris, is that you with the American Rescue Plan Act update? Yes, Commissioner. So Chris is going to um, start off by, you know, kind of giving you an update on all of the projects that we have under the American Rescue Plan. Kind of our, I mean, we're coming up on some critical deadlines. We have some decision making for projects that cannot be completed by uh, December of 2026, which is a deadline. They have to be under contract at the end of this year. So we've been monitoring, obviously, and making some decisions on these projects carefully. And so he's here to give you an update on that and kind of tell you our plan of action. Go ahead, Chris. Good morning, Commissioners. Chris Rose, Office of Management and Budget. Thank you for having me back. I'm making a regular occurrence here, it appears. So uh, thanks for having me. So uh, we all know that the that Pinellas County got $189 million from the American Rescue Plan Act, which went nationwide, uh, local governments, everywhere else, in response to COVID-19. These are the six categories that we have projects in, and I could give you some examples under public health was our sheriff's mental health units, uh, negative em economic impacts are many of the parks that we've got in there, Danville Park, things like that. Water and sewer infrastructure are, uh, the largest one of those is the mobile home, uh, manufactured home uh, project in utilities. Revenue replacement is sort of the catch-all and that has the uh, computer-aided dispatch with some swapping, but that's, that's how we got that one funded. Um, <clears throat> surface transportation is the North Trail or Walford and Whitney, um, and then administrative costs. So <clears throat> as the administrator said, we have been monitoring everything. You've seen this chart before. We have, uh, it's actually gotten better since we printed this. So. Instead of eight projects in our yellow, we have two. And I'll talk to those in just a minute, but we've been monitoring, moving. Uh, the dark green are ones that, <coughs> excuse me, out of breath. The dark green are ones that have already met the project deadline of this December, and the green, light green are ones that are on pace. Yellow are ones we're watching. There are none in the red category. <clears throat> and if I can go back to that, commissioners, the, the, like I said, on those deadlines, those are hard deadlines. And obviously, we don't want to um, send any money back to the federal government, right? So um, so we've, we've also have backup projects. So projects that we can move quickly on, get them under contract, and deliver if, in fact, we find a project that's not going to be able to be completed in time or be under contract in time. So that's the reason you're seeing where we had projects that were in the red. Well, we've moved them out in some cases because we added, a, a, for instance, we had the septic to sewer. We brought that to you before where because of right-of-way issues and acquisition, we knew we just weren't going to meet the deadline, so we switched that over to the mobile home parks. Well, we're only going to be able to do about four or five mobile home parks. I forget the number, but there's eight that we could do, you know? And so if we can, if, if we need to move projects over there, those are real hard projects that improve our capacity. And so we, we kind of have a game plan on as, as we come up on these critical deadlines, we got to make a decision because we want to make sure that, you know, we use the money that we're getting. Yes. A microphone. On the two projects that are yellow. So it drops from the 38.5 million to closer to 15, but probably even a little lower than that. I'd have to get that exact number. And they, and they, and those, those have moved up to the light green or? The rest of them moved to light green. Okay. Yes, sir. Yep. Any other questions? Go ahead. So Safe Routes to Schools is one we wanted to, uh, to show off first because it's a high priority project, 12 underserved neighborhoods. Something we would not have gotten to were it not for ARPA. And uh, we, are, we are closing in on this. This is one that was on the yellow list and is now on the light green list. And Public Works is just moving forward on it. So moving at a great clip, they've made some changes in how they're delivering and they're getting it done. 
And, you know, and commissioners, th you know, this is actually an old project that is probably, I don't know exactly when it was created, but it's probably a decade old, um, where you had everybody come together and create the safe routes to schools, and we just never had the funding to be able to complete it. It's these sidewalk gaps, um, but it's getting keep people off, off the roads and in, into these. But it's not just throwing down, you know, as you know, you can see that particular picture. It's not just throwing down concrete. You have to move utilities. You may have other types of things underground. So it's much more involved than, than putting in a sidewalk. But we're very happy to be able to address this backlog that's occurred for a decade um, and create a safe place for our kids to walk to school. And I'm happy to say we're going to have a ribbon cutting coming up. We're deciding which location to have that at, but uh, communications and public works will let you know when that's ready. Next up is Ray Neary Park. You all approved this last commission meeting last week, and it is moving forward. Again, something we would not otherwise have gotten to were it not for ARPA, or at least not gotten to as early. You all are all very familiar with the project. I don't need to go into it. And human services software system. So this is the last legacy system. We talk to Jeff and Brian about this all the time in BTS. This one was also on the yellow list and has moved to the green, light green list. It had, uh, we had to go back out to bid. And now we're fully on track to get this software in process and, and get it done. <clears throat> Finally, just uh, one more highlight is, of course, the not-for-profit fund. You all know about it. We've done all four rounds. We have 79 not-profits that we have served with 88 different grants, $17.5 million out in the community. Are they on target to finish their projects on time? So we have met the deadline with this one because it has gone over to the foundation. That meets the deadline for us, so we're good. Ah, oh, okay. Do you have a question? <coughs> Commissioner Scott. Thank you, just to follow up to that, is there any of those funds that are gonna be coming back, or is all the, are, are all of those projects going to be completed and all that money spent? We're monitoring that. If it does, we'll bring it back to you. Right now, we don't have an indication, but it is absolutely something we're watching. So a couple of next steps, and this is my last slide. The deadlines that we talked about, the first one is this December 31st. We have to have everything under obligation, which means under contract. So we will, we have a dead, uh, process, a uh, timeline for every one of these, and uh, we're moving forward. We have a two deadlines then for spending. One is for the 15 million in surface transportation, <coughs> and that is September 30th of 26. And then all the rest need to be spent by De December 31st, 26. And I'm happy to say we're on a pace to get that done. Great. Thanks, Chris. Any questions or comments? No? Thanks so much. Appreciate Thank you. it. We're going to move on to number two, the affordable housing and preservation. Good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Rysov. I'm a project manager with SB Friedman. I'm here uh, today with my colleague, Jeff Dickinson. Uh, SB Friedman is an urban planning and economic development consulting firm based in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, we work with municipalities and other public sector agencies around the country on various real estate development projects and uh, community planning. Um, as you know, this board, uh, Pinellas County and its uh, partner municipalities, uh, developed a housing action plan a couple of years back in order to support the creation of more housing choices attainable to people uh, at all income levels. Uh, as part of those efforts, Pinellas County uh, engaged SB Friedman. I'm sorry, could you speak a little closer? Ah, yes, to okay, thank, thank you. you. I wasn't picking yeah, just up, pull, You can probably pull it a little closer to you. Closer. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, as part of those efforts, uh, Pinellas County engaged SB Friedman um, to uh, conduct a housing assessment to project countywide housing demand through 2035 and research best practices uh, to preserve legally restricted affordable housing and help transition naturally occurring affordable housing to legally restricted affordable housing. And these support various housing action plan goals. Uh, first off, the housing demand. Um, 
we uh, prepared a housing demand model that uh, takes into account population growth and other demographic and market factors uh, to come up with the numbers you see on the screen. Uh, we project that to meet the anticipated uh, growth and anticipated demand that we're expecting to see in the county, uh, Pinellas County and its partner municipalities uh, you know, should add approximately 47,000 housing units by uh, 2035. Uh, this comes out to around 3,345 housing units uh, per year. Over the last five years, uh, Pinellas County and its uh, municipalities uh, permitted an average of 2,730 housing units per year. So uh, our projections uh, represent a uh, moderate increase over uh, the historic average. Uh, and we believe that to meet the anticipated uh, demands that we're uh, expecting to see, uh, the rate of housing production uh, across the county uh, you know, will need to increase for all housing types, but particularly for multifamily housing, uh, as Pinellas County is becoming increasingly land constrained, uh, we believe that single family housing will uh, constitute a smaller share than it has uh, historically. Uh, these are the same numbers, just cut by income. We took our projections and split it up by AMI level, so that's what you see on the screen here. Uh, we estimate that to meet the anticipated demand, uh, Pinellas County and its municipalities, uh, that around 26% of the net new housing units will be needed for households earning 60% AMI or less, uh, another quarter for households in the 60 to 120% AMI range, and uh, the remaining half or so for households earning 120% AMI or more. Uh, recent uh, market rate housing production has been heavily weighted towards those higher price points, and uh, we believe that production needs to continue um, and, in fact, increase in places uh, in the county where it makes sense to do so. Uh, but we also believe that Pinellas County municipalities and other partners should continue uh, in their efforts implementing the Housing Action Compact and uh, growing the supply of new homes affordable to lower and moderate income households. Uh, these are some stats uh, around the Affordable Housing Development Program, uh, this program uh, you're uh, very familiar with. Um, but just to summarize, um, between January of 2021 and January of 2024, uh, this board approved 15 projects, uh, which will help support a total of 1,253 uh, affordable units. Uh, the assistance comes out to a little under $40,000 per unit. And if you take a look at the chart, you'll see that most of the units produced have been at the 60% uh, AMI level or below. Uh, we also took a look at the existing uh, affordable housing stock uh, within Pinellas County. Um, the land trust units and the public housing units are permanently affordable, but uh, as you see on the chart, uh, the majority of units are subject to uh, expiring uh, affordability covenants. Um, over the next five years, uh, there's not that many units that are uh, losing their uh, affordability restrictions, but uh, that number does grow if you look 10 years out or 20 years out, which speaks to the need uh, for why the county is uh, looking at this issue uh, right now. Uh, we're well aware of the many efforts that uh, Pinellas County has uh, you know, underway in implementing the Housing Action Plan. Uh, this includes updating zoning codes and regulations, uh, building partnerships across sectors and industries, and uh, engaging the community around housing. And uh, Pinellas County staff will speak to some of these efforts shortly. Uh, but I'll just say that we endorse the Housing Action Plan and the work that this board has been doing, and we urge that uh, Pinellas County and uh, its partners uh, continue efforts in uh, moving forward on housing affordability. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, we looked at what jurisdictions around the country are doing um, around uh, preserving affordable housing uh, and came up with a list of best practices. Uh, I'm not going to read off every single word on this uh, you know, page, but uh, I guess our overarching recommendation is that the county provide clear guidance um, around um, affordable housing preservation, um, what projects uh, are eligible, uh, how to apply, and uh, what uh, applicants uh, can receive uh, if they are awarded funding. Uh, we believe that, uh, you know, given, um, you know, the uh, amount of naturally occurring affordable housing and uh, legally restricted affordable housing in, in the county, um, there, there's a, you know, strong stock, but it is subject to, uh, you know, expiring uh, affordability covenants or might lose its affordability through market forces. We think that uh, affordable housing preservation is a very strong tool that can add to and complement the uh, existing affordable housing framework that Pinellas County has. 
Um, so yeah, there are various uh, you know considerations to keep in mind um, when it comes to preserving affordable housing um, related both to maintaining the quality of uh, units and uh, extending those uh, affordability kind of covenants. Um, and yeah, with that, I will turn it over to Bruce, uh, who will speak to the Live Local Act uh, amendment. And commissioners, Bruce is going to talk Live Local, okay? Um, but. But, he's, but I, I really want him to kind of talk about, okay, with all of this, why? You know, we've got a great study, but what does that mean? And tie that back into what we're trying to do with the Affordable Housing Compact. You know, the, the pieces that we touch are only a small piece of the overall housing stock, most occurring within the municipality. So how as we, as a region, as a compact, and a, as a group of all the municipalities, what are we going to do together to try to address the deficit that they talked about within the study. <coughs> Morning, commissioners. Um, wanted to highlight a few of the items from uh, the Live Local Act. As you know, that was passed last year, 2023. Um, a lot of key items there for affordable housing, including additional funding at the state level. And the biggest thing probably that everybody's most aware of is the preemption of local land use and zoning for affordable housing development on commercial industrial and mixed use land. And so this year in the legislative session, there were some bills passed that would amend the Live Local Act, kind of in two ways um, regarding the land use and zoning. They're basically some minor clarification type items. Uh, I just wanted to highlight a couple of those related to basically density, height, and floor area ratio. The new amendments would um, basically preempt the local government's floor area ratios for qualifying developments, and so that would increased 150% of the county's highest floor area ratio. So that adds additional density allowable based on floor area ratio. There is a provision that would also require local governments to reduce parking requirements. Um, there's some, some requirements based on how close they are to transportation facilities. One provision would limit the height of multifamily housing if it is next to single family residential. I think that was one of the criticisms that came from some communities that large high projects could be built right next to single family. So those are some of the minor things that would be changing if these amendments are signed by the governor in terms of the land use and zoning. On the tax issue, there's what's commonly known as the missing middle tax exemption. And again, this was passed last year and is in place. And that provides a tax exemption for qualifying multifamily developments. To be qualified, it has to be a project of 70 units or greater constructed in the last five years. And so as it stands today, that development, if they restrict under 80% units, they would receive a 100% tax exemption. 80 to 120 would receive a 75% tax exemption. The pending legislation, the approved legislation, if signed by the governor, would allow taxing authorities to opt out of that missing middle 80 to 120 tax exemption. And so that would be a decision up to the board. It does take a two-thirds majority to opt out of that provision. So again, it doesn't appear like this has been signed by the governor. We anticipate that it probably will be. Um, we're kind of we're researching that. We're working with the property appraiser's office to see what kind of an impact this could have. Um, your colleagues in, in Pasco County were some of the driving force in looking into this based on concerns of that higher income level and affordability and what that means to tax impl implications. So at this point, there's only five applications that have been submitted to the property appraiser's office looking for that exemption this year. And so we're going to continue to work with them and probably come back to you with some additional data and perhaps a recommendation on, on what that opt-out would mean. And another thing to keep in mind, it is per taxing authority. So for a project to receive that full exemption, each taxing authority, be it Swift Mud, School Board, City would have to approve various ones. So it is just by taxing authority. So with that, um, quick summary of, of Live Local. Um, and with that, we'll be happy to answer any questions. Or? Well, I, so we haven't talked um, as, a, as a body a lot about Live Local um, because we're still trying to figure this out. Um, you know, and, and we had some, one of the things that I think we, we we didn't really fully understand is, well, um, one, because we didn't have any projects that were before us, but now we do, or now there's at least discussions about some projects like that, is they get full tax exemption, OK? 
Okay, so that's a key piece. So the question is, how do we apply that when they're coming after affordable housing funds? You know, can you double dip, right? That's actually how we had, we ran into a discussion at a staff level because I didn't even realize it was a live local. They had the ability to apply for live local. So that's kind of a modification to procedures we need to think about internally and in how we're reviewing a project. Um, they're already getting a full tax exemption. So, you know, that should be included in the subsidy um, calculations that we're doing before we bring projects to you. Um, you know, so we, I mean, literally Bruce is telling me something as we're reviewing a project that, that we simply didn't, you know, know. So that's a, not a, that's a modification. Um, two, the, on, on some of the, when they look at your ability to be exempt out, you have to certify that you have sufficient affordable housing. Um, that's, that's the terminology, correct? Yeah, there has to be a sufficient affordable housing for that income category, and it's based on the Schimberg study data, and that study data looks at the entire Tampa, Clearwater, St. Petersburg, MSA. It goes all the MSA, way up to Hillsborough, including I mean, other to Hernando. And because it goes all the way up to Hernando, we would um, be eligible. So it, it looks at it as a region. So that's how, just when, when, I, when we say that and you go, well, we know there's not a... Poor, so you do have the ability to do that. It would be for that 80 to 120, you would exempt that out to where uh, they, they, couldn't get or they couldn't get that 75% tax break um, on that. So that's a choice um, that you have. Um, yeah, and, and I would add to that, the project that Barry and I were discussing, it, you know, it's a market rate development now, and they were attracted to looking at penny funds that we could contribute to the project to make it affordable. But on top of that, they were also very attractive because of the tax incentives. So we had to kind of look at both. And if we look at just those under 80% AMI, when, when you reduce the rents for that, it's very significant in terms of, you know, you may ballpark $1,000 a month in lower rent. And so that was very attractive. When we look at the 120% AMI, that's not too far off market rent. And so you've got to sort of evaluate that. If we were to subsidize that, look at that on top of the property tax exemption, over X number of years, how long that is. So it's kind of changing the calculus on that. With this particular project, it, it doesn't look like we'll be able to move forward um, in large part because of this opt-out provision. The, the developers now doesn't have the certainty that they will gain that, that tax exemption. So it's kind of stalled that project. So by itself, I don't think the exemptions will probably incentivize that under 80 criteria, but it, it's very likely to hit the 120. And again, not lowering the rent very significantly. So it's a choice that we have. Um, and the main the main thing we want to make sure we calculate all of that when we bring a project to you, um, in making a determination of how much gap funding is needed to be able to get that into the affordability rates, either either down below 120, the 80 to 120, or 80 percent below is automatically el eligible. So, um, but cap up all the, all of what we're doing. You you just gave a report that really talked about the, um, uh, the gap in the amount of affordable housing units that are being created. So, so what? What are, you gonna, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna work with the compact um, to preserve current affordable units as they come due, um, renovate affordable units that are, are older housing stock, um, and then you know, encourage new? Yeah, I think, I, you know, to summarize, there's certainly no one fix. There's so many different things, so many different ways that housing can become affordable, whether that's down payment assistance to home buyers, ADU ordinance that we're working on, land use zoning incentives. We're very familiar with the new developments that the penny funding is assisting with affordable housing development, um, along with preservation. It, you know, it was great to have the research, the study done that, you know, in the short term, we're not going to be losing too many units that are expiring affordable housing restrictions. There's, I think, just over 100 and some units expiring this year. We've reached out to those owners. Those are mission-driven organizations that intend to keep those affordable. So, you know, we've got a little time to work, and we're going to continue to do that outreach to ensure that we don't lose units from the affordable restricted stock. Um, over the last few years, I'm really only aware of one complex that was lost. We've been negotiating with multiple entities that are looking to perhaps repurchase that facility make that affordable again. And, and along those same lines, we've got four or five other projects that we're negotiating with that are what our consultants would call natural occurring affordable housing. These are market rate units that are a little bit older that we're talking to developers about buying them, 
putting restrictions in place and, and um, preserving those. So there's a, there's a broad range, but those are very expensive projects too. Um, one that we're looking at, 84 units, it would be about $31 million. So for the developers to do that, on the affordable side, they've got to get the state funding, line everything up and, and do that, or have the resources to take that risk. So our program's always provided funding for preservation, um, but at the consultant suggestion, we're gonna take a look at how we can maybe market that a little bit more specifically. We market our program now as affordable housing development that includes new construction, acquisition, renovation. So there may be some opportunities to kind of reach out to the owners of some of these existing units that are larger scale, provide some resources that might incentivize them to, to restrict some of the units. And um, one point I think is kind of important that came out of the research is a lot of times we talk about the affordability period and older units might stay affordable in terms of just market demand, the rent they command might not be that high, but without those income restrictions, those units are wide open to anybody moving into those units. So if you have the income restriction, you're at least reserving those units so the workforce, the under 80%, the under 120, 120% income groups can, can access those. Um, it kind of prevents that situation where maybe that becomes a second home or a vacation rental or, or those kind of things if there are restrictions in place longer term. And so we are also analyzing our, our programs. Anytime we provide funding, it's typically 30 years. The land trust is from perpetuity. Uh, we did have one project with Habitat that's a, a 20 year on the affordable housing side. Um, home ownership's a little bit different in, in that scenario. So we're looking at maintaining those longer term projects and we're also looking at better ways to evaluate preserving existing units. But just one last thing to note there is, you know, the preservation costs do not seem to be that much less than the new construction costs from a subsidy standpoint. Um, you know, the overall project cost might be lower, but because of the resources that a new, new construction project can bring to the table, the per unit subsidy is still, you know, forty to fifty thousand dollars from the projects that we're recently looking at. So, um, but again, working with our partners, looking at incentives to promote affordable housing, bring the issue up. Um, our next presentation from communications, we'll be talking about the work that um, the team is doing to elevate the issue, to raise awareness, and um, and those kind of things. So, in, in partnership and working with the municipalities and continuing to to not only fund projects, but advocate for, for affordable housing. We hope to continue the momentum we've built and, and increase upon that. Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Excellent presentation, and thank you. All of the things that we're talking about that um, seem to be potential roadblocks are things that were brought up during this session mm -hmm. when we were looking at the bill and saw that there were a lot of holes in it where um, there was ambiguity as it relates to how you interpret it, what you could and could not do. Um, my concern is, um, and, I, and I understand what you're saying as it relates to the 80 to 120, but even based on 80 to 120, when you're looking at close to the market rate, that still is outside of the financial opportunities for some people based on what our current salaries are um, for market rate. Um, and for some of those projects that have built market rate where they may establish um, five units or 10 units to go towards 80 to 120 AMI. Even that becomes difficult because you're looking at your construction costs per unit, not just for those units. And so it makes our numbers way off if they come to us and ask us for funds from our penny uh, pot to, to help with that construction. Perfect example is the project that's on the corner of 31st and 22nd Avenue, um, I'm sorry, 26th Avenue South. Beautiful project, not all affordable, only I think it's 10 to 15 units of that entire project. Um, so here's one of my questions. When, and perhaps you all can get an answer for this. We're looking at how much of our penny money should go towards a project that may be participating in uh, asking for the tax exemption for Live Local. Are we also looking at the layering of the funding? Because they don't just come to us, they go to St. Pete and where we partner, they get um, Florida Housing Coalition dollars, mm -hmm. they, you know, they get funds from a myriad of sources. So I just wanna make sure that we are including that if we're looking at yes. how we're going to determine how much money we will give them if they're looking at the layering of those finances and they're only providing a minimal number of units 
um, that are going to be affordable. Commissioner, yes, we're absolutely, I, I actually think we're at the point where unless you have layering of funding, we, we can't make a project work. Okay. Um, it The subsidies become so great um, that, I mean, well, like the project that I discussed with you all that we said, we, we just can't be in it. It's, it's too expensive per unit. And mm -hmm. Um, so we have to have other funding sources. So that, that becomes part of this evaluation with Live Local. Do, is that another layering of source to where we can make projects work or do we want to exempt out the 80 to 120? It's a question um, that we, we've, got to, we've got to discuss. And, and our situation is very different from PASCO um, because in PASCO the rents are, are lower. And so with the exemption, those, the numbers, the, the, the affordability numbers are market. And so up, but down here, it's, it's, it's more expensive even for the rent. And so does that gap, you know, should we allow that in order to be able to drive that down to where it's an affordability piece? We've, we've just started talking about this and trying to figure that out. But that's a, it, so it's a key question. But we cannot do projects on our own. We have to be last dollar in. They're coming in at $150,000 subsidy per unit. Um, we, we were, we, we didn't, uh, until a year ago, we didn't uh, approve a project above 40. Right. Um, so it's just it's just gotten too expensive, right? And the last thing I'll say is um, Commissioner Starkey and her her commissioners they're doing I think a really good careful job about looking at how mm -hmm. their requests impact other counties. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that um, in some areas they're speaking for like the whole state when they bring up their issues and concerns. Um, unfortunately, though, because they had a lot of vacant property and land, a lot of developers, of course, went that way and they started construction. And so now it's becoming the issue that we now see in Pinellas Park. Um, and so I think you'll start to see some waning of affordable units there because of that. But um, thank you so much. Great presentation, good information. Um, and I am hopeful that on this session coming up that there will be the opportunity to do some additional tweaks once we see or once Tallahassee sees how this impacts, really impacts communities' uh, ability to provide some housing. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other questions or comments? So I, I got some concern about the double dipping. I mean, I really have concern mm -hmm. about all that. So um, I assume you're going to take a look at that, and it's going to be item by item. But um, we, I, we're, we're we're actually going to come back to you with a recommendation about whether we should exempt out the 80 to 120 or not. Um, you know, we, we we're not there yet um, in terms of a recommendation. Um, we just really started digging in on that and looking at it. Um, but that's a that's a choice for the commission. So this is this is the first discussion about it. Okay. Well I look forward um, to seeing that. But it's it's so commissioners <laughs> and you know you put it in your strategic plan, right? And you and, and so we're taking the lead from you know, the direction you provided. But I'll tell you it's personal. Last night I was out with two shifts at a nine one one. That's the first thing they ask is how do we how do we continue to afford to live here? This is our employees. You know, and they're the ones feeling the heat of the rent that just skyrocketed. And um, so, you know, it's impacting us all and it's impacting our employees. It's impacting, you know, their neighbors and our kids and, and everybody else. It's, it's, you know, so that's, it's a big deal. <laughs> okay. Commissioner Eggers. On the exemption, is it um, one time exemption period for all property in, uh, for all projects in? all areas for for instance if we're if we're trying to encourage people in certain areas like residential and or commercial versus industrial can we do it by that to encourage certain activities that we want to see um, the opt-out provision for the 2025 tax year would have to be approved and adopted by the end of this calendar year um, and then it's good for a two-year period, and basically the board would have to do it on an annual basis. To my knowledge, it cannot be site-specific. I haven't read anything about that, but I'd have to defer to the attorney's office to review that. Um, to me, I, everything I've read, it's opting out of the missing middle tax exemption, so I don't think it would be site-specific. Um, we we'll research that a little bit further, but um, it is an annual process that the board would have to adopt each year. Um, anybody that's get, gotten that approval prior year before an opt-out would be grandfathered in and would have that for the lifetime of that project. Um, but I don't think it's location specific. 
again, though, it is by taxing authority. So if a project was in the city of Clearwater, the city of Clearwater would have to make a choice. Are they going to opt out of the tax provision, the county would, Swift Mud? But we could do it piece, piecemeal, right? Not, not all of them have to do it to have the opt out in effect. Correct. We could opt the out. Might, the city the might, the city not might not. not. Okay. Right. But from a developer's perspective, just knowing that opt out provision is possible, now they're unsure if they move forward, are they going to get the city to opt out, the county to opt out? Well, the other thing that continues to bother me, and I, and I know, um, is this whole 20 year um, life of the of the of the issue so in 20 years we start to lose the pot lose that inventory that we've invested in so I, that that concerns me well and that's, about, that's what he was talking yeah, about I that know. we want to do that and then the project you brought up to make sure we can invest in and that's the reason i wanted them to touch on that if somebody wants to renovate older housing stock i mean i think that's got to be a key part of our strategy um yeah. but um, and we can do that, and, but we probably haven't marketed that well. And so we need to focus on that, you know, and it's think a about cheaper. Within, a lot cheaper. Uh, yeah. and so that's, that's, a, that's a piece. But again, that's the reason the compacts, it, when we talk about these things, is so good to address because we're only dealing with, you know, a portion. We need all the municipalities all doing the same thing because that's where a majority of that stock would be, you know, ripe for redevelopment. Any other comments or questions? No? Okay. I look forward to you coming back with that. We um, will. And I do, I do like the, the rehab stuff. I, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not sure why it's still the same per unit cost to us, <laughs> but uh, if the project cost is less. But, you know, when they can get so much subsidy, I mean, how much are they investing? I mean, is it all government, is it all taxpayer investment at some point? When they're going to get tax breaks, and I, I you know, at some point, I, I don't, I, I don't. Yeah, and let me be clear that it's not one for one. Every rehab is the same cost as a new construction. I didn't mean it that way. Just um, quick example: we're looking at a 208-unit project. It's an existing structure. Acquisition price is 26 million dollars. Proposed rehab is 8.3 million dollars, and so they're looking at doing a four percent multifamily bond deal and basically they've got about a four million dollar shortfall so we'd be looking at about forty thousand dollars per unit so forty thousand is certainly that's that's a lot less less a lot less than the 58 the 60 the 70 80 um so yeah and we have a lot of old inventory that could be acquired that way i know a lot of corporations are buying them and just raising rent without doing rehab um because they can but when we can get someone that can do that investment I think, you know, I think that's a great option. Yeah. And that's where we have to also kind of recognize that these other funding sources are limited. So, you know, so for instance, that one is a 4% deal. You also have 9%, okay, but that's limited amount of funds. And then you have ship dollars, right? So, you know, they're looking at it. How quickly do you want to move, <laughs> you know? And, and so some we may have to subsidize more because we want to get more housing stock out there than others, but we still... We still need we need still need to layer it with other funding sources. It sure would be uh, nice to understand the net present value model that these developers use uh, because it's 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 just a, it's very confusing to 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 understand the different elements the, t the stuff that we're talking about the 20 year life of of, of benefit uh, before we g go at risk and so just understanding what they're looking at with all these outside layering of, of financing help and mm -hmm. um, to, to see what is fair and reasonable. Because I, you know, I, I would do what's fair and reasonable, not, you know, not things that just don't seem to fit. So anyway, yeah. thank Any you. Any other questions or comments? No? Okay, well, thanks right. so much. I appreciate it. We're looking forward to you coming back. Okay, up next, where's Josh? There, there's Josh. So the, the next thing we ask the, um, uh, the housing compact to look at is, you know, we, ha we have, the, there's a real misperception you know, about, you know, affordable housing units or attainable housing. Um, and it always becomes a zoning issue. And, um, and then we have, we, we needed to do more to, as we approach projects. And so Josh is going to talk about a proposal he, they've been working on, our communications have been working on. Uh, with the coalition to assist in that. All right. Thanks, 
Barry. Um, yeah, we'd like to talk about a communications campaign that we've been working on in partnership with our compact partners at the cities. Um, our, really, our goal, uh, as, as Barry alluded to, is to refocus the story of affordable housing on the real people, the real lives of people who it most affects. And, and the fact that these are folks who are our neighbors, folks who grew up here in Pinellas County and who are really struggling to make ends meet because of the housing crisis. So uh, the goals of this, this campaign, and it's kind of a soft campaign in the sense that it's something that's gonna be an ongoing, evolving messaging effort. But th the goals are number one, to change the perceptions about what an affordable home looks like, who lives there, uh, and how it impacts our existing community and neighborhoods. Um, like, I, like, like Barry mentioned, these are folks who are first responders, teachers in our schools, folks who are taking care of uh, our, our uh, senior residents in, uh, in ALFs, and they're our neighbors. Um, and the second goal is really to build a coalition of people who are educated about the housing issues that are going on in our community and who are aware of when there are significant uh, housing decisions that are being made so they can uh, lend their expertise or their voice uh, to the decision-making process. So um, on this next slide, this is just an overview of what we've done so far under the Countywide Housing Compact. Um, we have seven cities now who have joined the compact since uh, it was drafted back in 2020. And uh, last year was really a pretty significant year for the compact with the launching of the Housing Action Plan and our second Homes for Pinellas uh, Summit. And uh, really this, this uh, communications effort uh, is an, out, uh, an, an outgrowth of the Housing Action Plan. So goal nine of the Housing Action Plan specifically calls for developing a joint communications and outreach program. And uh, that's what this is. We've been, like I said, working closely, especially with the three large cities that are very involved in these issues on a day-to-day -day basis and crafting some of these messages. We've also done some preliminary message testing with folks outside of local government, with some of our business community, tourism community, nonprofits to uh, you know, see if these messages resonate, if they really communicate what we're trying to communicate. And we've gotten some positive feedback so far on that. So this is an example of what we're trying to get across. Um, it's very important to, uh, to, to, to see concrete examples of what we're talking about. People have perceptions of what a, an affordable house means and, or affordable home means and who lives there. But if you look at this example of Skyway Lofts, one of the more recent developments that, uh, that the county and city has supported, uh, the folks who live there, they're working at Baycare, Johns Hopkins. They're working at Pinellas County Schools. They're folks that are you know, our, our, our neighbors and who grew up here. Um, our keynote speaker at the first Homes for Pinellas Summit, Dr. Tiffany Manuel, uh, mentioned that uh, what really is effective in communicating about affordable housing is, is noting that uh, everybody needs the people who need affordable housing. These are, th th this is what our community is made of. So that's a big thing we're trying to communicate uh, in the materials that we've been developing. Uh, this slide uh, is the, uh, captures sort of the, the overarching message that we're trying to get across, local homes for local people. Um, a lot of folks that we've met going out at media events for affordable housing grew up right here in Pinellas County. Um, they remember growing up here when housing costs were less. They're, wor they're working full time, uh, and yet they just can't make ends meet. Uh, and so, like I said, we need to uh, recenter the story around, around these folks. Um, we did some research to, to back up uh, the, the, the approach we're taking in terms of messaging. Uh, and I'm gonna just mention three things that we found in that research. Um, one of those is to talk about housing in terms of homes instead of using the phrase housing as much. Uh, everybody understands the fundamental value of having a stable quality place to live, the stability that brings to your family. And so that's relatable to everybody. So that's why we're gonna start using the phrase homes as much as possible in the language that we use. Uh, the second is really focusing on real people that are relatable, uh, whether it's a senior who's uh, struggling on their fixed income to continue to afford their place, or a young professional who moved away to college, came back and is having a hard time leaving the nest uh, to find their own place. So we're gonna be telling these stories. And lastly, focusing on tangible concrete solutions. A lot of people become overwhelmed by the enormity of the issue, so we're gonna focus on the specific things that we are doing and the things we're trying to do and how people can get involved in that. 
This is just a couple of examples of the types of stories we're trying to tell. Uh, the first is uh, Tangela Butler. She is a Habitat homeowner, uh, a school bus driver for 22 years in Pinellas County, who nonetheless, uh, less than a year ago, found herself and her family uh, on the verge of homelessness. Uh, but through the Habitat program that the county supports, she was able to find a home, and she was able to move into that home just a couple of weeks ago in Lelman. Uh, the second example is our down payment assistance program. This is Dylan Floyd. He's a middle school teacher an example of uh, you know, a young man who grew up right here in unincorporated Seminole, moved away, uh, and he was able to get into a home right near the school where he teaches through our down payment assistance program. So this really reinforces the importance of what we're doing and the, the need for us to do more of these types of projects and support these kinds of policies that are going to create housing choices. So lastly, this is my last slide, I want to talk about just some of the ac specific actions that we're going to be taking uh, with this effort. Uh, the Homes for Pinellas website is really the hub for the housing compact. That's where both Pinellas County, Ford Pinellas, and our city partners are sharing our overall goals, um, the policies that we're, we're pursuing. Uh, and what we're trying to do now with this website is really refocus this on human stories. So you'll see that if you go to the website now that we're focusing on the stories, especially of local people in our community. The other piece that we've updated on this website, and this is very important, I think, for going out in uh, explaining uh, why we're doing what we're doing as local governments is we've, we've expanded a, a long education and FAQ page that really addresses a lot of the common questions. Questions like who qualifies for affordable housing? Uh, how do we ensure that the housing we support remains affordable over the, you know, over the long haul? Uh, and also just how does, how does new development, whether it's more dense housing or different housing choices, how is that going to affect existing neighborhoods? So we tried to address a lot of those questions in the FAQ, working with housing and community development. And it's a living document, so as more questions come up, we'll continue to expand upon that. Um, we also have several pretty important events coming up in the next couple of months, uh, groundbreakings and ribbon cuttings. Uh, there's two next week, actually, in St. Pete, uh, where we're going to be focusing on really telling the stories of the local folks who are, are benefiting from those projects and, and get that story out to the media. Um, and this, this, this next one, I think, the next two, I think, are the most important things that, that Barry was referencing. We're, what we really want to focus on is getting people engaged. People can hear about this, and it sounds good theoretically, but people want to know what they can do, what their role is. Uh, at last year's Homes for Pinellas Summit, we asked people to sign a pledge to be a community champion for housing. And we're going to be taking that list of contacts and new partners that we've been making through the business community and the nonprofit community and, and starting an, an email blast that goes out on a regular basis to let people know both some of the positive progress we're making, but also when there's key decisions being made that uh, might, might uh, necessitate getting some community input or, or having your voice heard. So we're going we're gonna to be getting that blast email out. We're also researching some other best practices for neighborhood outreach. Um, Habitat for Humanity of Orlando and, or, uh, Orange and Osceola County has a similar campaign going on right now called Face the Housing Crisis. And one of their goals is to identify somebody in every neighborhood in their community who is educated about the housing issues and who can get involved and lend their expertise and their voice. So we're gonna, we've got a, a meeting scheduled with them to get some input from them about that effort. And so we're doing some more research on some ways to effectively engage at a neighborhood level on this. Um, and then uh, lastly, uh, I think it was mentioned in the last presentation, Fort Pinellas, the Fort Pinellas Board is the impl implementing body of this housing action plan. So they're getting regular updates from partners and from both the compact and housing partners outside of the municipalities about some of these efforts going on. Uh, and we will also be uh, offering an update about this campaign and other things to the Fort Pinellas Board in the coming months. Um, the last thing I'll mention is uh, we're developing some communication materials to empower you all and other elected officials who are prioritizing this issue. Uh, that just has some basic talking points and overview of the housing compact, the action plan. It really explains the why of what we're doing um, so that, you know, as we got in the community and we talk to more groups who might be able to lend their help or expertise in this, we can uh, have a common message uh, as we go out and, and uh, into the community. So um, with that, I'll uh, open up to any questions. Questions or comments? No? Well, thank you so much. We appreciate it. We're going to move on to short-term rentals. Josh. As you see, we've got a full agenda today. Next up, uh, short-term rentals. 
And Kevin's on his way up. <laughs> Good morning, commissioners. Kevin McAndrew, Director of Building and Development Review Services. I'm going to um, first just give you a very brief general update, and then I'm going to transition to what the framework of a proposed ordinance update could look like and how that ordinance update would be shaped subject to whether Senate Bill 280 is signed by Governor DeSantis. So let me start with a, uh, a snapshot of short-term rentals in Pinellas County. And this is current data as of last month. Um, there are approximately 2,700 STRs within the unincorporated county and about 18,000 in all of Pinellas County. And I want to just point out the reference on the, on the illustration there that says unique rental units. And the reason that term is used is because most owners and operators today are listing on dozens of host platforms. And it'd be, it would be very easy to have short-term rentals, double counted, triple counted. This, these are the unique listings that are tied back to parcel ID. So pretty confident this is accurate data as of last month. I don't think it's a surprise to anybody that over the past year there's been a 25% growth rate in the number of short-term rentals in Pinellas County. All indicators, projections are showing that there's likely a sustained annual increase of 10% or greater. This is a very sophisticated industry. Um, it's no longer the homeowner renting out their house. This is investment groups, small and big, that are supported by very sophisticated technology uh, that uh, provides data on where to invest, what the return on investments will be. So this is an industry that is very dynamic, really progressing quickly on, on, a, on an annual basis. So very briefly, how we regulate short-term rentals today in unincorporated county. We have a provision within our land development code that I would characterize um, provides for basic quality of life standards. It importantly does have a maximum occupancy of 10. It does have a specific parking provision, one space for every three occupants. It specifies quiet hours. And it also specifies what is fairly standard with short-term rentals, which referred to as posting requirements, responsible party, hospital listing, emergency contacts, and this is fairly uniform in most places. I think what's important here is that we don't have a registration program today. And we don't have an accounting other than just that data I showed of where those 2,700 short-term rentals are located, whether or not they're, they're operating um, in compliance with our regulations. We've used what's called the zoning clearance. It's been entirely ineffective. Um, in our database, we have about 10%, about 300 of, uh, of short-term rentals that have actually gone through zoning clearance over the past five years. And the likelihood is that they're not even operating today. One of the, one of the interesting uh, pieces of data that I didn't share on the first slide is that there's a high turnover of, of, of short-term rentals and the number of new entries each year, and this past year, by way of example, was over 30% of that 2,700. So the database that we have, while being entirely insufficient as far as the accountability, it's likely outdated. So this is, this is a big gap in something that we're looking to um, address going forward. I'm pretty confident one of the reasons why I'm here today to discuss this with you um, is tied to the data that I can share on the number of complaints. Up until about 2022, the number of complaints that our Code Enforcement Division received was really quite de minimis. I mean, they were, in some years, they were single digits. That has changed. Um, last year, we saw over a 300% increase in the number of complaints based on the first quarter 
of 2024, that's going to jump even higher. So I don't think, again, it's a surprise that there's a correlation in the number of complaints tied to, uh, tied to the increase in the number of short-term rentals operating. So I want, to, I want to kind of calibrate us here on the role of the state with regard to short-term rentals. And today, the state statute preempts local municipalities from regulating the frequency and the duration of stays associated with short-term rentals. The only way that this could have been avoided would have been if a municipality um, had regulations on the books prior to 2011. That's not the case here in Pinellas County, so the preemption prevails. What's important where I reference what happens with Senate Bill 280, this is yet to move to the governor's desk, is that there are a series of additional preemptions that are included in this bill, and I want to just highlight those. Um, licensing will be preempted to the state. Um, host platforms will be preempted to the state. Importantly, and this one is of, of definitely of concern, is that this bill contains uh, provisions that would supersede our regulations associated with a maximum occupancy of 10. And this bill includes language that it's my interpretation, and I've consulted with the county attorney's office, there's no cap on occupancy as long as you're compliant with two occupants per bedroom, two in the common room, um, as well as another provision which states that as long as there's 50 square feet per occupant in a bedroom, that also applies. So do the arithmetic. If you have a 300 square foot bedroom, that can, that can support six occupants. So the numbers here are likely going to increase substantially above today that uh, we have a cap of, uh, of 10. The bill does. Um, include provisions for municipalities to have a registration program and an annual renewal. Um, this is an important provision. Again, this is one that, that is the first step in what we believe would be bringing some, some increased accountability. Uh, the bill also allows for, uh, for municipalities to integrate inspection programs tied to life safety, the Florida Building Code. I'll speak a little bit more to this on the, on the following slide. Another provision that is of concern um, in this bill, the bill reads that municipalities may regulate quality of life standards if uniformly applied whether the property is used as a short-term rental. And what this means um, is that the parking standard that we have for short-term rentals, which is one per three occupants, is stricter than what is applied to a standard single family home, which is two parking spaces. So this would be another, another area where parking would not be able to be used as a tool to regulate short term rentals. The bill does include provisions for fines, which we don't have that ability today, and also the option for suspension and revocation. These are, these are important considerations moving forward because that, those, those provisions today do not exist, and they are included within this bill. So the overall approach, you know, I've used the word accountability, is, is, is our recommendation is to move forward with a registration program, and that's whether or not Senate Bill 280 um, is signed by the governor or not. The intent would be that we would move this registration program, it would be administered through our code enforcement division. Um, the bill, if passed, has very specific provisions as to what the registration program can include. I think these are beneficial, um, sort of as a completeness check at the time of registration. Uh, an owner-operator would have to verify that they've been licensed with the state. They would have to verify that they're registered, um, both at the state and county level, to pay the, the bed taxes. It would also bring likely greater compliance um, with, with Homestead. Um, it also provides the ability that if there's any change in ownership, 
or change associated with the property, that that has to be updated within the registration program, and the maximum occupancy would have to be listed on that registration. So these are all, I believe, positive pieces associated with the registration program. The life safety is, is also an important consideration. This is one, though, where I would like to separate the fire districts from, from BDRS. And when we're talking about life safety as far as egress provisions, exit signs, we're talking about uh, compliance with um, smoke detectors and carbon monoxide, some of our fire districts in Pinellas County have already adopted their own ordinance and inspections programs. So at this point in time, I would not be recommending that we double dip on that. Um, I believe this is moving forward with, uh, with most of the fire districts um, taking this into account moving forward. I, in speaking with one of the local fire chiefs, you know, an important provision, uh, I think, benefit that comes out of the inspection program is that we would share this with the local fire districts. Think about, they get a call, they think they're going to a traditional single family home and arrive and find out that it's a short term rental with 14 occupants in the house you know, sharing this information with the fire districts, I think it would be a very, uh, very important consideration that we can benefit from a registration program. You know, so I've spoken to the fact that there's 2,700 plus or minus an unincorporated county. It would be literally impossible to try to manually figure out where these these, uh, these STRs are, are located um, and how they're, how they're operating. Fortunately, uh, there is very robust technology uh, that is available that supports local governments. Um, so the recommendation would be if we move forward with a, um, with a, uh, with a registration program that we would, in fact, uh, contract with the third party vendor and they can bring a lot of automation to the registration. They can bring proactive compliance to monitoring occupancy. The technology is incredibly powerful. They scrub every one of these uh, host platforms on a, a, on a two day basis and are able to pick up through documentations of listings and, and other forms of, of evidence whether or not they're compliant. Um, and they're able to, in turn, uh, largely automate uh, notices of violation to these properties. So this is a really key piece to moving this forward, I think, in the most, uh, in the most beneficial manner. So um, I don't want to repeat myself. I'm just going to jump in here. The registration program we're envisioning, uh, that there would be a first-time fee as well as an annual renewal. We've looked at what others are doing. These fees are right in line uh, with other municipalities here um, in Pinellas County. Um, and probably one of the more significant tools, if the, uh, if the bill is passed, would be the ability to impose a $500 flat fine for those uh, properties that have not registered. This is one of the, I think one of the pluses uh, in the bill to use a tool that we, we don't have today. While there is the, the provision of a license suspension and revocation, I have to say I have concerns about the actual utility of those provisions. To give you just one example, uh, to, to move something forward to where there would be a 30-day suspension, an owner-operator would have to have five separate violations on five separate days within a 60-day period. That's going to be hard to, to monitor. It's going to be hard to really administer that. Any, any operator is going to know they just need to get past that 60-day window, and they can start all over again. So there, there's concerns with those provisions in the, uh, in the bill as well. Our next steps, um, we're tracking, of course, Senate Bill 280. We'd like to bring forward. Um, an updated ordinance, depending on where that lands, by late summer, early fall. Um, we, would, we would prepare a business impact statement. Whatever program we move forward with, we want to make sure 
uh, there is no impact on the general fund. We want to make sure that this, this program, that our annual fees re and renewal fees will cover third-party support, will cover additional um, staffing. Um, this will require some degree of additional staffing, but this would all be based on, on, a, on a business impact assessment that, again, would, would provide that, uh, <clears throat> that, that analysis. Subject to moving this ordinance forward, uh, we would want to engage that third party as soon as possible and look to have a registration program in place by the end of this year. Would I know that was a lot that I threw out there. I'm sure there's no questions. <laughs> Commissioner Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Kevin, for that. I've been waiting for this for a long time. I think we all have. Um, so if SB 280 does not get signed, do, do we not have any authority to uh, issue fines for noncompliance at this point? Well, we have the ability to, to move forward with our standard process of a notice of violation, um, and that would just take its course um, through, the, through, the special, through the special magistrate. So we do, we do have um, a process. I think one of the challenges with short-term rentals is that in many cases, the violation that occurs is instantaneous. And by the time it's investigated, it's been corrected. And it just, it's the nature of this, this business that it's a, it's a, real, a real struggle to, 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 you know, to move forward with an effective enforcement side. I think um, at the end of the day, I 100% agree we need to move forward with the, with the registration process. At the end of the day, we need more enforcement, instant enforcement. And, you know, code enforcement is not on duty during the weekends when the majority of these complaints occur. So whatever the registration fee, I think we should, the registration fee should be also to include whatever additional enforcement we think that we may need on, on weekends. Because that's when, you know, Almost every Monday, I'm getting emails from, and we all are, from, you know, residents and constituents that are sending us emails and videos of bad things happening, and I've got them in my own neighborhood. I mean, I had to close the windows last night because just two doors down, there was a ruckus going on at midnight. So, um, you know, and the, and the sheriff has bigger fish to fry. He can't re re reply to respond to all of these noise complaints and things that are going on. So. At the end of the day, I think we also need to look at what does code enforcement need in terms of resources, and I think we need to we need to back in our registration fees to make sure that we've got adequate resources there to be able to to handle these things. So. Yeah, that's excellent input, Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Completely concur with you, Commissioner Scott. Did I hear you say that in some instances? Um, it would allow for six people in a 300. Yep. I, I heard you say that. Yes. So bunk beds, I guess. Um, it's, it's, it's bunk beds. And in fact, we've, we've of recent had a number of, um, of cases that have come before us where there's been operators without building permits, building out garages with built-in bunk beds, you know, already in construction, um, but but yes, that's exactly the. Uh, so I guess my, my concern with that is, um, we have individuals who have farm workers that come over. They can't even allow people to reside in conditions like that. For those of us that are single family home members, that would be considered a safety issue. This is not at you. I'm, I'm just saying. I just I find that extremely interesting. The other thing is I. The fee amount that you're looking at, I really think it should be more than $250. I have my LLC. If I pay my LLC late, I'm paying four, $400 if I pay it late. So if I'm doing really well in business, it, it doesn't affect me by paying $400 late because I'm doing well in business. So for the, the $500 flat fine for failure to register, they can make that in one stay. So it, it's not a deterrent. Um, I'm just saying maybe look at the structure because that's not really a deterrent if if I'm booking it out four or five days a week or even on the weekend so I'm elevating the cost because it's a weekend um, activity or event I'm making that so I'll pay the fine 
you know, and just I'll take my chances and I'll pay the fine. I personally would not do that. Please, let's clarify that. <laughs> let's clarify that. But I'm just saying, you know, looking in the mind of the person who's looking at um, being able to, to, to utilize this, and it certainly has become a huge quality of life issue for some neighborhoods because, yes, we receive emails almost every day. Uh, now we have video <laughs> of persons encroaching on other people's property, which now would require to call the police because they've jumped the fence and gone onto someone's property. Um, now, I don't know how true this is, but um, I had a conversation with someone the other day, and I was told that the governor probably is not going to, to, to sign this bill. Um, so this has become a real issue um, for us. I, I appreciate and I do believe it is a code enforcement issue and concern. Um, but I, th I think that we need to look at a, a, a department, if you will, within code enforcement that specifically deals with this because code enforcement is going out there looking at some kind of, you know, junk trash and debris, those kinds of things. But I think we should have someone within our own confines in the code enforcement department that specifically deals with this so that they are interacting immediately, whether it's confirming information through uh, Mr. Twitty's office um, or, um, you know, coming back to um, what, is that, what is that area zoned for specifically. Um, so I, I think we should have some a small group specifically dedicated towards this because when you look at the numbers that you've been able to provide us with for unincorporated, just us, um, and thank you so much for those being non-repetitive numbers because that really is crucial. Um, it is a growing concern. I don't think it's anything. And you know, if people find a way to make money, they're gonna they're going to continue um, unless those strong guardrails are put in place that really deter. Now, am I against people finding legitimate businesses and legitimate ways to enhance their income? I am not. But as you stated in your presentation, and as we have found in our communities, that may not necessarily be the case in all of these instances or the majority of these instances. So I would like to see us increase that fee for the first time annual as well as renewal. I would like to see a late fee um, imposed if it's um, paid late, and I would like to see that $500 fine, um, and I wouldn't necessarily like to see it flat. If it's not paid by such and such a date, then um, each day that it's not paid, that there are additional fees attached to it. So that's my 200 cents worth. Commissioner Long. Thank you, Madam Chair. I only have one question. How do you know that there's 2,700 units? Well, this was data that was provided by one of the leading um, vendors that supports many of the local governments right here in, in Florida as well as in Pinellas County. Host Compliance, which is a grant assist company, they, they scrubbed, and they have this data, uh, they have this over every footprint, almost the United States, uh, and they were able to provide that that data as of last uh, last month in March. So the data is you think it's current through March of this year? Yeah, that's current data. Interesting. Thank you, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. When when does the governor have to take action on the bill? What's it? I forget the timelines. Yeah. July. I just heard six different dates. So, all right, we, we'll. Um, I know. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, if if we if we go forward with the the registration plan that you're talking about, by are we doing it just in unincorporated, or we do countywide? No, this would strictly be uh, unincorporated. The other municipalities, in in many instances, have their own. Uh, ordinance and registration programs. Okay, so that, that's what I want to make sure. So by my math, that's the first year about six hundred and sixty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and then half of that going forward. And then I assume that the vendor that's going to do the all the computer work and all that's going to take a chunk of that. They would take a chunk of that. I don't think it's necessarily realistic to think that we'd have one hundred percent compliance in the registration program too. So, you know, there's um, it'd be there'd have to be a significant marketing and communication plan ahead of 
of this going in place. But um, I think you know the uh, the input from Commissioner Flowers would also change the analysis here too to potentially bolster um, staff within code enforcement. So we're going to have to look at at all the numbers to make sure that they, like you said, where there's no ultimately no impact on the general fund. So the um, and most of the complaints that we get are the house parties, the loud noise at, late at night, the multiple cars, the you know um, that that type of more than any other in violation of whatever code that we would have. Um, but nothing in the legislation has changed the fact that we still have at a county level no ability to regulate the location of these facilities. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Thank you. Mr. Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I mean, we talked about this a little bit yesterday at the, at the uh, TDC meeting. I know, I got Dave in there. Um, I mean, short-term rentals are, are here to stay. They're not going anywhere, but we have to manage that process better. Um, and this is um, really kind of a, a symptom of our destination, this county being so popular as a destination, right? Um, having short-term rentals gives people options other than simply hotel rooms when they're, when they're going on vacation, and options are, are good, good for consumers. But at the end of the day, it's going, it's a commercial activity in a residential neighborhood where commercial activity was never, never intended, never meant to be. So whatever we do here, we have to make sure that, um, as I said earlier, that code enforcement has the resources that it needs to be able to, to manage this process. I think going uh, down the road with a registration fee is, is, a, is a good good start. And I agree with Commissioner Flowers that, you know, 250 is probably not enough. Um, maybe not even for, for, the initial, for the initial one. I think we do need to figure out what does code enforcement need in terms of resources. And is that a, a separate division within code enforcement that's gonna specifically monitor short-term rentals and then kind of back into that number uh, so it doesn't affect affect the general fund because this is you know we saw what 25 percent growth in short-term rentals over the last year and we're probably going to see what another 10 percent and that's a lot coming out of come out of housing inventory as well which also affects our affordability so um i don't think we should be shy when we when we set that registration number and um, we have to make sure that um we have code enforcement properly funded to be able to handle these complaints when they occur you're making Jude's day. <laughs> Commissioner Eggers. Um, well, Commissioner Scott was just touched on uh, most of the things that, that I was going to say. Um, the philosophy about whether they should be in our air, in some of these residential zones is, 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 is not even arguable. I mean, the state has originally asked us to create these residential zones, commercial zones, you know, industrial zones to do the activities that normally go on in those areas. So they've they've changed the rules to allow things that are normally commercial to come in. And you're right, they're not going away. Um, they're gonna be a part of our, uh, our process. And to the extent that we're allowed to do things, I think we need to take full advantage of it. Um, I agree with the comment that, you know, the sheriff has better things to do, number one. But number two, they're not armed with anything to enforce our codes. They don't have they don't have sound meters in their car. I mean, I remember the fight in Dunedin trying to make sure that every one of our sheriff folks had that in the back of their car, but also were trained on it. And then, when and how could it be used? And it, well, we we just do it from the street. Well, that doesn't mean anything. What if what if the noise is in the backyard and you can't register, but it's plenty loud for? So there's just all kinds of issues with that. So I like the idea of, of the of code enforcement but not the regular code enforcement that takes 30 to 60 days to fix a problem. You know, you have time to do it. This is more instantaneous. And I think that's the, that's the key. The fines are way too low that we're, and I don't know what control we have over that, but I'll bet you every single one of those owners that owns those, those places gets a security deposit from folks that are using those places to make sure that they're treated properly. Almost seems like we should have a deposit uh, in, in, in addition to the the, the, the sign-up fee that is used against, you know, that they will get back at the end whenever they get rid of it, uh, of that, of that. But if they don't, we're going to use things against it. I mean, I'm not saying it's, I'm sure I'm talking about all kinds of things that aren't legal. <laughs> but frankly, if you don't put teeth in this, it's just 
talk. And our residents deserve better than that. Every single one of us continue to get comments from our residents. That, that's a minuscule number of complaints that, that people have that are out there. They, they just figure, why bother? Number one, why bother? And if we do do it, there's not much they can do anyway. And if they want to, even if they can do it, it's like, well, how are they going to implement those, those, those things? So it's just a complicated process. And I think the more that we are really, it pushed the limit and get, get deposits from these folks, get their, the registration fees, and fines have to be instantaneous. And, um, um, and you know, it, not fines necessarily on what the resident next door is, is saying about the place, but when our folks go out there and confirm it, they're officers of the law, that's all it takes. You know? And so um, we just have to do what we can do. And you know, whether the governor signs it or not this year, there's such an appetite for this apparently up in Tallahassee to allow this kind of activity that you know some version of it will come back next year and the year after and the year after. So we've got to do what we can do, to, as you said, uh, Commissioner Scott, to manage the process. Um, step it up. You know, we're going to talk a little bit in a, bit, uh, in a little bit about raising standards. That's what we're talking about, raising standards in our community to the extent that we can. So appreciate your... your uh, presentation today. Commissioner Lettville. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to take a bit of a contrarian view. And I agree with uh, Commissioner Eggers that the fine portion may be a bit light. And, and uh, I agree that we should look at raising that. Um, but when we look at the registration fee for the um, both the initial um, registration as well as the annual renewal. I believe we should look at what uh, the surrounding municipalities uh, are charging and try to be in line with that because I don't believe that um, somebody a block over should be treated differently uh, just because they're an unincorporated. Um, so I'm uh, hesitant to jack up those prices without knowing what um, other registration fees are going to be in Pinellas County. Um, and as for the, uh, and this might be more of a question for Chris or Barry, uh, but for the um, covering the cost of code enforcement, I think best case scenario, we would probably only be getting maybe 400,000 or so annually uh, from this program. Uh, to cover code enforcement for um, the uh, short-term rentals. And that would not cover the cost of the employees to, to, to look at these, would it? It De depends on how we implement the program, how many staff we add to the program. So we haven't actually done a, a heat, you may have, um, but I haven't actually seen a kind of a budget for this. Um, because right now we're kind of in that fact-finding, waiting to see if the governor signs the bill or not. And we wanted to bring it to you to, to have a discussion and get your feedback before we kind of design the programs. Yeah, because um, that is something that I would want to look at when we, to, to kind of see what, what our annual projection would be and how we would be spending that money. Because I, I like the idea of using it specifically for code enforcement and having it on the weekends, but I want to see what the the cost of that's going to be and how many employees and and whatnot. Um, and I like the idea of jacking up the fines, you know, and maybe raise it to a thousand bucks from 500. Um, but the I, I'm a little hesitant on jacking up the uh, registration fees if uh, what's being proposed by staff is what's in line with other municipalities in Pinellas. Uh, Commissioner Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just to comment on, on, the, on, the, on the fines versus the registration fees. What we don't want is a situation where it becomes a, a fine-driven revenue stream. I mean, we don't want code enforcement intentionally out there just trying to ding people, you know, to, to, make, to make a budget number type thing. So that would be the only, I mean, I, I have no problem with increasing the fine levels, but I want to make sure that the registration fee kind of covers the majority of our of our budget in that respect because you just don't you know you just don't want that impression that it's just a fine generating revenue stream so that would be my only caution on that any other questions or comments 
Let's go to the attorney because I have some comments that you're gonna you're gonna want to weigh in and and sure. I know. Do you want to do you want to go first or you want to wait for me? Um, well, just in response to a couple of issues that have already been raised. Um, we, I, I, I'm hearing that we don't think that this has been sent to the governor yet. He has 15 days to act once he receives the bill. Um, if he does nothing, it becomes law. So that's, that's that process. Um, fines are limited by state law, and it would depend on how the action is brought as to what the cap is going to be. I don't know, you know what the proposal might be. Um, when you go the route of writing a citation and it goes to court, like it's heard in criminal court, although they're not criminal violations, uh, the maximum fine there is $500. Um, if we take it through to the magistrate, there could be additional fines. You know, and again, I don't know what, what code enforcement is looking at. I could see pros and cons here as to going both ways. Um, a lot of times with the magistrate, we'll, we'll go there for fines that are recurring on a daily basis where, you know, somebody might have trash in their yard and it stays there for 30 days. You know, under the code, every day is a separate violation. This is a little bit different. I don't know that we could say every day is a, a, you know, a separate violation because, again, somebody could be there for one night. Um, so I'm not exactly sure how we would be proposing on bringing it, but just be advised there are limitations in state law as to the maximum fine that, that we could raise. That we could, I'm sorry, that we could impose. Okay. So I spent 11 months living in Airbnbs. And the cheapest I found was $5,000 a month. And I was paying $10,000 a month for several months. So the idea that the registration fee is too low, I think, doesn't count. And when you have homes, now this isn't unincorporated, but we have homes in Reddington Beach. And because they didn't have uh, a, uh, an ordinance in place before 2011, they thought they did. It turns out legally they didn't. They can't. And those people are charging $14,000 a week to stay in the homes on Reddington Beach. A week? A week. They gutted those mansions on the beach. They put 14 bedrooms in them, and they're getting $14,000 a week. So the notion Jeez. that you think $1,000 for registration <laughs> is too much, I think is not accurate. Coming from someone who had to Airbnb for 11 months because my house got damaged. So, uh, you know, I had spent two months in one house, not during season, and it spent and it cost me ten thousand dollars a month. And luckily, I was able to get a deal for five thousand dollars a month in Madeira Beach. And so, you know, the the notion that the registration is too low, I think, isn't accurate. Um, this is a big money maker. And the other thing I'm going to tell you, I know Kevin, you said you think this was scrubbed and this was really good, but at the TDC meeting yesterday for the February numbers, and they believe that their numbers are scrubbed really well. They said that the county had 23,924 uh, rental units based on the tax collected. So I, and, and that doesn't include the ones that, that aren't on the regular sites that we know of, and, and the ones that are operating illegally. So I think the number is much higher than even your scrubbed list. I agree. And so, um, my other concern, and Jewel kind of tapped out on that $500 cap, is I think, and I don't know, this would be my legal question, is you can't find a house next door that might be a rental, an outrageous fine. Let's say we charged them a fine of $1,000 because there was too many cars parked there. Um, and then next door, it's a residential. They can't afford that $1,000 fine. And so, and, and if it has to be consistent with what the residents are, have to pay, because I think it has to be consistent. If you're going to have a fine for one too many parking, then it has to be consistent for the residents. And if you make the fines exorbitant, then you're really penalizing the residents who aren't bad actors, who aren't renting out their homes. Um, so, and I think that it has to be a equitable. I'm not sure that's a legal question. Um, but the other thing about looking around to see what the other municipalities are doing, you have one municipality that can't do really anything. You have several municipalities that had ordinances in places and don't allow. Treasure Island doesn't allow Airbnbs. So, um, so it's hard to be consistent when every city and municipality has a different policy. So, um, so I think we do what's right for Pinellas County. I think we don't really worry about the municipalities, but it's going to be too hard to be equitable about that. Um, the big problem that the municipalities are having is enforcing it, finding who's illegally doing it. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of problematic. But 
Uh, like I said, Treasure Island doesn't have a fee because they don't allow them. So, you know, it's hard to be equitable on that one. So I think what we do is we focus on the plan and how we can, how we can I, I think we need weekend enforcement. So I think it needs to be based on what, you know, what's it gonna take to institute a program and maybe base our, our, our registration fee on, on that. Um, but the registration fee doesn't bother me, and I'll get you just a second. The registration fee doesn't bother me if it's high because the revenue that is generated in these Airbnbs is significant. Um, and so a $1,000 registration fee to me is nothing. Um, you know, granted, I might not, you know, especially for the corporations that are coming in and buying up all these homes because that's really the problem is corporations are buying it. It's not the individual, and there are plenty of individuals that are making money on this, but corporations are big into this industry. Um, and, and I can tell you, you know, we need them, and we need that diverse uh, housing here because our airports are bringing in riderships in record numbers, and if we didn't have them, we wouldn't have housing for them, so our airports wouldn't have record numbers um, if there wasn't enough equitable housing for our visitors to stay. Um, we are noticing on our numbers that it definitely is taking away from hotel room nights, um, and people seem to be using the Airbnb more than maybe hotels, and that seems to be a trend that we might be seeing based on the numbers that we're getting um, at the TDC. So um, it's an interesting thing. We need to find a balance. Um, absolutely, they're here to stay, but we need to find a balance in which it, it you know, they operate in a way that the neighborhood, the quality and peace of, and safety of the neighborhood is still sound. Um, but I'm not afraid of the registration numbers. Um, but the fee, the, the fines, I'm concerned about because of equity, and I don't want, I don't want some person who lives next door that might do the same thing with one of those nuisance codes, have a fine that's so exorbitant that they can't afford it if it has to be equitable. So, so Jewel, if you can answer that, and then I'll come to you, Chris. A couple other things I'll comment based on your your comments. Um, keep in mind that when you impose fees, they need to be um, commensurate with the cost to run the program. So in other words, the fee can't be placed so high as really to be a disincentive. That's really what fines are intended for. So really to, to get to the fee, you, you kind of need to know what your program needs to look like, what the staff would look like, what the cost of the software might look like, and kind of go from there. Um, it's just like the building department. The building department is, is designed to be self-supporting from user fees, in other words, the, per, the fees that are collected for building permits. Um, as far as the, the parity between, you know, a house that's being used as a short-term rental and others out there, we do have a specific provision in your zoning code that deals with some of the nuisance factors and what it talks about. Um, I can tell you, let's see. Um, it talks about parking, noise, the you know, number of occupants, um, having a responsible party, you know, available to touch base with. That is unique to short-term rentals, so the fine imposed for this or for this section of your land development code would most likely be different. We do have a separate noise ordinance, for instance, uh, and separate zoning provisions that would apply outside of the short-term rental context. So I couldn't say for certain, because I don't know what the fines are associated with those normal um, zoning violations that we might see for any property in an incorporated county. Um, and just for your reference, primarily your fines for your ordinances are imposed by an order issued by the court here for cases that go to court. So in other words, if a citation is issued and the case is heard in county court, there is um, an administrative order issued by the court that sets forth a fine schedule. So those would be the fines there. They're typically lower. Uh, when you go to court, 500 is the maximum fine imposed, so the fines typically, of course, start lower than that. Uh, for cases that come to your special magistrate, the, fi the fines can be higher, and they can, they can run on a daily basis and accrue, and of course they can be imposed as a lien against the house. But to get at one of your fundamental questions, I think you would be talking about different ordinances applying to just the short-term rentals, which are very specifically defined in here as to what that type of property is, as opposed to a normal, like a, a primary residence, a, a rental, like on an annual basis, something like that. Commissioner Latville. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. So I have a question for Joel that deals uh, kind of with the equity component. When we're doing the registration fees, would we be able to set different fees based on if it's a someone who is renting out their bedroom, um, like in Pinellas Park, and that's and I've never you know done this, but I think you can rent out a bedroom that you're living in for like thirty dollars a night, um, or you know a couple hundred bucks a month, compared to the example that. Uh, Commissioner Peters gave of the mansion that's fourteen thousand uh, dollars a week. Um, that so, or or we do it that the mom and pop um, who has one single bedroom house that is listed uh, on these um, websites, and it sounds like we have that data, so we would know how much they're listing it for. Um, and we can use that past data that, okay, if they've gotten, you know, a couple thousand dollars a month or they've gotten a few thousand dollars a year um, for their house in Pinellas Park or Seminole or Largo compared to the companies that own like 50 of these or, you know, several mansions on the beach and treat those differently than the, the you know, large companies. I, I think that you, we could probably look at the program and come up with some kind of tiered approach. It would most likely need to be based on things like square footage available to be rented, because you're correct. I know that there are places that just rent a bedroom out while the, you know, the owner actually resides there as well. Um, but you would need to base it on subjective, I think, factors like perhaps square footage. Your own ordinance talks about, your, your current ordinance um, talks about for instance, um, a, a maximum occupancy, it currently states no more than two persons per bedroom with a, with a cap at 10 people. So maybe based upon the number of bedrooms available, maybe something like the number of times a year it's rented out. I think that we would need to base it on factors like that that really get at um, the administrative costs that you know we might have. You know, the bigger, the bigger the rental, the more likelihood of more people there and more noise and more of these nuisance factors that we hear. Whereas if it's a single bedroom, you're gonna have less of that. Particularly, I think, if the owner's living there. Um, maybe not, but I think that, again, I think we need to probably tie it to maybe times a year it's rented, maybe the square footage that's available to be rented, uh, factors like that, as opposed to the income coming in. Would although we, although we, could, we could look at that and see if we thought it was something that we could factor in. Would we be able to treat companies that own certain number of properties different than? I, I would want to look into that and do some research on that one before giving a solid answer. But we could certainly look into you know, any issue with, with staff as, as far as putting together a fee schedule. Okay. Um, I am on board with doing a tiered registration okay. approach. Makes sense. Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Jules, so when you talked about, um, and if I misunderstood you, please correct me, when you talked about a maximum fine amount of, let's say $500, um, municipal ordinance violations, which are often used when you have someone that may have, we had code enforcement cases, remember, and some of the fines and fees were, they, they were more than what the property was valued at. And so the intent for those in that situation is to get people to do the right thing. And then when they can't, what can we do to try to um, sell the property, have it rehabbed or whatever the case may be. So if, if those types of violations can accrue beyond 500 and we look at it through an enforcement issue, a code enforcement issue, why could that not apply to this situation? Am I confusing you? Okay. I, I, you know, again, I'll, I'll get back to you. get to what I'm it. saying? It, yeah, because I understand what you're saying, having a limited amount for a fine, fines and fees. Mm -hmm. But if we have fines and fees for code enforcement issues for individuals with property, some are rental property, mostly rental properties are the ones that we have, absentee landlords or absentee, yeah. Um, and so if that applies over there, why couldn't it apply? So I, you may need to search that, but why couldn't that apply here? I do support what's being said. You know, of course I came out and said, I think the fees were too low, so certainly support that. 
Um, I guess my other question would be, um, like the language that you said we have in there that limits two persons to a bedroom, et cetera, but how would we be able to monitor that? Short of having a code enforcement officer go in there to make sure that it's only two people staying there. And yeah, it could be two bags when the officer goes there, four bags after they leave. Um, and then I guess my other question and or concern is, when persons have issues with their short-term rental or whatever, um, I have seen occasions where a bedroom was rented out, an agreement was made, um, instead of it being made through the proper um, source, it was between the person renting. They don't want to leave, so now we have a squatter situation. They come to us to try to resolve that. We had nothing to do with the person being there in the first place. So now that becomes a civil matter. So my question is, what role, if any, do we or can we play when it comes to assuring that the places are habitable, that there are no issues, no, no violations, you know, do we do inspections? Who does the inspections, if any? I don't know that, that's why I'm asking. Um, because whatever we do, we also need to make sure that we are very clear that that would be a civil issue. <laughs> that is a business agreement between whomever and that individual. The county is not in it because unfortunately, they look to us to resolve that issue um, when we know that there's an issue. Now, I do know, and I appreciate what the governor did when it came to squatters' um, issues and concerns here. I think that's a step in the right direction. Um, but anyway, those are some additional questions I have. If we can do that with a municipal ordinance violation, why couldn't that carry over to this situation? Do we have any ability to look at, um, or how do we go in and, and assess um, to see if it's two people, four people? As to like some of the habitability issues, you, you have a, a minimum housing code and, and other provisions currently in your code, even the building code that we could use to, to look at various issues that affect habitability. Um, on the, the issue of the fines, and again, I'll come back to it, I think one of the issues here is, is gaining the evidence that we would need to enforce. So again, and I'll go back to the example I used earlier, with our magistrate, we use it pretty routinely for those ongoing recurrent violations that are obvious. If somebody has a bunch of junk cars on their residential property, we can go there every day and see it, it's obvious. Mm -hmm. If somebody rents something out, we're not really sure up front how many days they're renting it for. I don't know how we get that information. I'm, I'm, I mean, this software I don't even think could produce something like that other than it's being rented, I don't know. Um, but even if it could, then it comes down to who testifies to that? How do we actually prove it? Do we actually have admissible evidence that we can take to court when we're using software? So those fines that stack up with the magistrate are for the open and obvious uh, code violations that again, it's the trash, it's the cars, it's, it's things that are plainly evident, whereas here, we don't have that. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody could go in and rent it and it could be just for one night, it could be for the whole week, it could be for two weeks. We don't really know and it's difficult to get into a premise to inspect it. We would need to see. We search. have to be allowed in. They, exactly. they could tell us no. So. Exactly. We, we could seek inspection warrants. Um, you're not gonna get those right away and that's part of the problem. Um, we can work fast and, and try to come up with a way to get that done, but some of that's gonna be dependent on the court. Um, it is easier to inspect non-owner occupied residences right. than it is something that's um, rented out. Of course, you're not gonna get that permission from the landlord. Um, you know, oftentimes we'll see cases where the tenant will let us in because they're complaining about the landlord, or, but that's not gonna happen here. You know, it's just not going to happen. Um, but we could look into all these issues and, and you know, work with staff to try to resolve some of the open questions, but it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge because of the evidentiary um, burden that we have going forward in court or before the magistrate. Okay, we're not done yet. Um, Commissioner Scott. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Kevin, earlier you, you said that you wanted to separate the independent fire districts from whatever we do here on, on with this issue. So my question is, are these short-term rentals undergoing annual fire inspections now? Only within, within the districts that have 
um, adopted ordinances specific to short-term rentals. Do we know? Do we know which ones have? Do we have? Well, one that I'm one that I am familiar with is Suncoast. Now that is largely the beach communities. It does pull in inland in one area. They adopted an ordinance in 2023, uh, requires annual inspections and so forth. So, um, again, in speaking with the uh, the fire marshals, um, I believe there is a an intent for all of them to to. Bring, bring this forward in a you know in a uniform manner. This there is follow up though on this issue too. To stay close with that group um, to know that uh, we don't have a big gap um, in what we're trying to accomplish. And Kevin's group actually is working with Indian Rocks Beach. Obviously, they're very, trying to be very aggressive on this. Well, we are their building official, um, yeah. so they right. outs where they've outsourced that piece, not the code enforcement piece, but the outsource the building. And so they need building officials for those inspections in terms of structural issues if they get in court. So we're very involved in, but it's 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 kind of different groups have different authorities. Right. Yeah. So so what happens? Um, I guess how do we find out, and when we find out, what happens if you know there's a four bedroom house that's been converted to an eight bedroom house, and none of that work was done with a permit. What, what what happens then? That would be a violation of uh, the building code. Um, and again, they would be subject to to going through uh, rectification of, of that space, you know, double, double permit fees. Um, so it would take its course um, through that. I, there is a, you know, in, in listening to the conversation here, there, there is the ability um, to include within the registration program to have a building inspector perform a an inspection of of each of these each of these units. Now, yeah. that will bring a degree of complexity um, to the program, but it is it is a viable option. Um, this would now now entail uh, two different divisions: licensed licensed building inspectors from our building division performing these inspections and interfacing with the code division as far as the overall registration. So, but it is an option. I, I would I would think that that would be a really good idea for at least the initial inspection and then yeah. maybe a self-certification annually thereafter. Because I, I know that there's been a ton of that that has occurred out there. Yep. I mean, it, it, you know, I've got one down two doors down from me that was a four bedroom house, it sold, it was converted to eight, and now it's advertised it sleeps 22, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I, 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 I think we should we should really look at that at least for that initial that initial registration. You can absolutely do that. It is right. it is a tool that we we can utilize. Okay. Great. So uh, Commissioner Eggers, isn't were you done? I'm sorry, no. Commissioner Eggers. Yeah. Um, you keep calling on him first, and he keeps bringing up the things that I want to talk <laughs> about. So thank you again. I think the idea of the inspection makes some sense to me intuitively, at least up, up front. And I think about you know safety issues, but also handicap accessibility. These are businesses, not residential houses. Those are different. So I'm just saying, making statements here that, you know, hopefully that that means that they have a different standard. Um, a licensed business coming into a residential neighborhood, that cat's out of the bag. We know that's going to continue to stay. But the standards that we apply for the servicing of a commercial business is a little bit more, uh, there's a lot more requirements to it. And I think you can do that through that inspection process up front. Um, you know, there was a comment made, I think, Jewel, you made it about um, every day could be a violation. It, I don't know why we would be limited. So if you go out there and somebody is having a noise issue, maybe, you know, do you find the resident that's, up, that, that, that's up renting the place? No, and the too. business owner, um, and and so the next day, they're doing it again. So you do you go out there and find them again, because it's a separate incident. I mean, because these incidents happen. Now we could get two that come in for two weeks in a row that are just perfect model citizens, and there's no issues. Then you get a a different group that comes in, and every single night there's a there's a party, there's a noise violation. They get the meter out there. They get the maybe there's even the thing where you give a first warning, but 
I mean, what what keeps us from accruing those fines on per violation, not because it's an issue? Because it's a violation. It's not necessarily the house isn't prepared correctly. That's a different issue. Um, so um, the the idea that uh, someone sent us the what is it the advertising and a advertising a safe and quiet neighborhood to their to the users and I, I you know obviously very ironic that that they would do that and then they come in and be the disruptors of the neighborhood so I think that there's there's a there's not only something that we that we can do but we should be doing to preserve our neighborhoods to the best that we can knowing that we're in, it's not going away it's going to be here but do the best we can and push the envelope I'm just tired of having every nuance thrown that says, well, if you do this, then we might have this problem, and then we, don't, we, we get such a watered-down version. I'd rather put the onus on them. They're taking advantage of a situation that we've allowed. They're here. They, they need a higher standard. And so I think whatever we can do, we need to move post-haste on this, get the, get the financials put together on what a department would look like, including a building department person option on that, too, so that we can look at that aspect of it as well. Um, it's a ready <coughs> to perform group, not a, it's, it's, it's a different mentality that needs to be present there than the normal code enforcement process. But yeah, thank you. Any response? No? I, I mean, I'll say, no, <coughs> noise is, I would have to believe that noise is probably one of the biggest issues um, that yes. people encounter living near uh, a short-term rental like this. And noise is a little bit different than a lot of your other ordinance violations. It's not something, again, that is there ongoing every day, like a car or trash. You have to be there, you have to hear it. You know, you have to encounter the violation really to be able to, to effectively write a, a, a citation for it. Um, so it's, it, it's a little bit harder one, although probably the biggest nuisance factor, aside from just the, just the sheer existence of the short-term rental there. Um, so that one, it's a little bit different. Not to say that we can't go out there and stack up fines, it's just a little bit more challenging. Uh, noise has always been a very challenging issue for us to deal with, whether it's your code enforcement officers or the law enforcement officers. Um, you know, your ordinance that's just the plain noise ordinance, not the one related to short-term rentals, uh, there, you can take it with a decibel meter, you can take a, a, a lot more subjective standard. Um, although one sanctioned by the United States Supreme Court. We were very careful about that when we wrote, wrote that ordinance back when. Um, it's been a long time since I worked with code enforcement, but I'm assuming they still have noise meters. I know they did when I handled those cases. And you're right, they're expensive. You have to get, they have to be recalibrated every year. Officer has to be trained on them, so it's an expensive way to write a citation, and there's a specific standard as to where you stand in the property line and things like that. So it's a little, it's a little hard to, it's harder than we would like for it to be enforced. You have some different standards under the short-term rental ordinance. I'm suspecting that that citation would probably get written to the person that's making the noise. Um, you know, but we could look at whether the property owner could also be cited. That might be a little bit more difficult. Um, one other thing, unrelated to Commissioner Egger's comments, I'll, I'll throw out there. I do have some people kind of helping me in the background and answering some of your questions and sending me messages. <laughs> um, it, it looks like there may be some preemptions on some of the inspections that we could do because of these being characterized as a public, public lodging establishment, but not in regard to the fire code or the building code, which are really your life safety you know, issues. So those are not preempted. We could absolutely do those. Um, so just another answer to, to something that you all have discussed here today. Thank you. Okay, I, I got a question. Is there a way and I know you said you want to do this for unincorporated only, and I know Indian Rocks is starting on theirs, but for conformity, you know, continuity for the county, is it something we would consider to do the registration for the county and do it countywide? Uh, I, Just to offer it. Not I, to say we're going to do it, but maybe offer it to the cities. Uh, I think that way, I like the idea of continuity across the county and that because right. nobody knows the difference because between one municipality border and another, <laughs> and uh, and if there's continuity, it's it's just better and easier for anyone that is interested in Airbnbs for their industry well, or business. But I, you know, obviously our our jurisdiction's unincorporated. I don't know from a registration standpoint 
uh, could we contract with a company and then offer that company to, you know, to, for other municipalities to piggyback on that, yeah. to keep that conformity? I doubt you could do this as a countywide ordinance, but I, I defer to the county attorney. I, I, exactly. And I would want to look into this just a little bit more because currently our short-term rental provision is in our zoning ordinance, our land development code. Generally, however, the county can write countywide ordinances, but if it's not related to one of your specifically enumerated countywide powers in the county charter, then the municipalities can opt out. Uh, exactly what Commissioner Flowers just alluded to. So, you know, you may find some um, that have a grandfathered ordinance that preempts them, which I'm assuming is the, the situation in Treasure Island. If yeah. you had an ordinance in place prior to 2011 that said no short-term rentals, you're good to go. Yeah. Uh, most most jurisdictions here did not. County, the unincorporated county did not. But you could look into doing something like that, and then it would be up to the cities to opt out, which they could do simply by having a contrary ordinance. You know, because um, we're such a tourism community, it kind of makes sense to have that uniformity, that, that continuity on, on that. And so I just, it's something I think for us to consider. <laughs> I'm just looking at the management of it, you know, obviously the, the, we're, we're, we're 20, you know, 700, whatever the number is of, you know, 20,000. So we're a small piece of that overall. We'd be, we'd be assuming that, that larger share. Um, but we, we can look at it. I mean, obviously, from today's discussion, we got a lot to work on. Um, and we also have to see whether the governor passes the bill or not. Right. So we'll, we'll come back to you with ideas. We'll look at what you just suggested and, and, and present some options for you and have more discussion. Okay. Uh, are we all done with this one? Anyone else have any more comments or questions? Okay. I think, uh, I think we're going to move on to... Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, so we're going to go on to animal services, <laughs> and so, uh, and you know this wasn't originally on the agenda, yeah. but then we got some news that uh, I must say I was really sad and disappointed to hear, uh, and so we wanted to um, bring him up and so if, if, give us yeah, an update. Yeah, thank you, commissioners, and and uh, you know I we we added this quickly because um, we wanted to have an opportunity for. Um, you really to discuss. We've talked in um, not in great detail because uh, we're we were looking at dis different options to enhance um, the animal care and stuff at, at, at our pet stores and things like that. And so we were looking at different options. And Commissioner Eggers, Commissioner Peters, and others have had discussions with Doug, and he's been researching a lot of topics. We weren't ready to bring forth options and ideas, but then he shared the bad news that. He made a choice for him and his family to relocate, you know, over to, you know, the, the worst coast. But, um, but that's his choice. Um, we didn't want to, we didn't want to go, have him go away, though, without sharing some of that knowledge, some of the things that he's looked at. So we don't necessarily have a formal agenda, but we wanted this opportunity before he leaves for, to be able to engage with you and talk about some of the issues that he's working on uh, that we'll continue to work on and then bring back to you at a, at a soon time. So with that, Doug. <laughs> do I, is it on or do I have to turn? Okay, it's on. Hi, Commissioners, Doug Brightwell, Animal Services. Um, because it got moved up quickly, um, we did not have a presentation presented. So I do have a kind of a brief outline that we would have converted into a presentation that's coming around to you guys, just so that you don't have to remember everything we're talking about. But we started out just kind of looking at the concerns. You know, Commissioner Peters has some concerns about black market issues and ways to sell puppies if there were no retail pet stores. But what we find over and over again is that really is not a, an issue because consumers adapt and utilize whatever available marketplace um, options are out there, whether it be retail pet stores, individual pet stores, or individual hobby breeders, buying puppies online, going to breed specific rescues, going to shelters. So there are a lot of available options whether you have pet stores in your district or not. So the black market puppy sales thing isn't as much of a concern because there are a lot of legal avenues for people to buy to buy animals with. Um, and just for the record, here at Animal in Pinellas County, we do, through our department, permit and annually inspect 
all individual hobby breeders, individual pet dealers, which are higher volume breeders who sell from their homes as well as our retail pet stores. Um, we went back and reviewed the um, breeding oversight because it's been a couple of years since we looked at that. And the oversight from the USDA and APHIS is not, has shown no improvement since we looked at it in 2022 at all. Um, there's no data to indicate that the state of the industry has improved significantly at all. Um, as you can see, um, in 2021, the USDA only inspected 65% of their commercial breeders. In, 20, in 7, 2022, they only inspected 77% of their licensed breeders. Um, they documented over 800 violations, but no significant enforcement action was taken by the USDA on any of those 800 um, violations they observed. So the oversight is still minimal um, and not where it should be for the industry. We have six pet stores here in the county. We do inspect them annually as well as respond to any um, complaints. We've had 18 animal welfare complaints from the stores. We have issued eight citations to three different stores, all for administrative violations. We have not found any specific animal welfare related violations to issue citations for. In, the, in 2023 calendar year, approximately 4,400 puppies were sold through those six stores. All of the stores have to report their point of sales to us every 30 days so that we can track and audit those sales. And we looked at sales of puppies in county to out of county. And 54% 54, 54 of that 4,400 puppies were sold to citizens who live outside of Pinellas County. Um, we also talked about the Purdue University Canine Care Program. We actually, I got an email from Dr. Crony this week, and we are scheduling a day for me and my staff to go through the standards um, on a virtual Zoom meeting. Um, we will have that done before I leave, and then one of my staff members will be in that meeting as well, so we'll have that completed also. Thank you. I believe that meeting is on May 3rd, just so you all know. Uh, I have a meeting with um, Dr. It's Conley, right? Crony. Crony on uh, May 3rd. Uh, he's with Purdue University, and so you'll have that. His, his staff will be on that meeting with me. Yes, we're going to have a, about a two-hour session with them to go over oh, the specifics of the standards. That will be a separate meeting, and we're still trying to get that scheduled the next couple of weeks. Oh, okay. And then your staff will be on the meeting with me? Uh, yes, I'll be on the Because I would really like to know what you come up with before that meeting. If we can get it completed, I will update everybody. Um, okay, at least at least let me before I meet with them. Yes, ma'am. No, thank you. I'd I'll make sure it. we get that done. Um, in evaluating the Purdue um, program, the program was started in 2013. It is funded by industries such as the Pet Industry Joint Advisory Council, also known as the Pet Advocacy Network, the Pet Food Indus Institute, and the World Pet Association. These are all breeding industry specific or related um, associations which do provide the funding to Purdue for this program. Validus is a third party auditor company that does the certification and audit process for Purdue University for the canine care program. They perform certification audits for eight different animal related large scale programs such as um, the dairy industry, the cattle industry, those types of things along with this canine care program. They conduct, they conduct the field audits and all the commercial breeders participating in the canine care program. Currently, they have 213 commercial dog breeders participating in the canine care program. They have another 10 who are going through the audit process, and they have 350 pending applications that are not processed yet for those to join. But that is still just a fraction of the thousands of USDA licensed breeders in the United States. Doug, is that around 20,000? How many? It, depending on, yes, depending on when you run the report from the USDA, it's 18 to 20,000 nationwide. This program consists of five pillars of care for dogs, and it encompasses their physical health, their behavioral health, their living environment, their breeding life, and their retirement and the caretaker expectations. Those five pillars, the standards for those five pillars are what we are intending to review with Dr. Crony and her staff once we've got the meeting set up. And I will follow up with once we've got the specifics on that. 
It's important to note that the canine care program does not apply to retail pet stores at all. This is specifically a breeder related set of standards. It has no standards relative to the retail pet stores. They are in the process of developing a standards program for retail pet stores. It is not completed yet to be rolled out. I have inquired that we do want to evaluate that program as well once the standards are developed and in draft form. And they have committed to letting us do that once it's ready. So at this time, just a uh, second, Doug, to oh. Commissioner Eggers. No, on, on um, you're going to be talking to them about these uh, about the Purdue yes sir um, standards, um, and so one of the big complaints obviously is about um, transparency. Yes, sir. The industry in general, nationally, yeah, and this program has no transparency. Yeah, I, I was just is not transparent at all. Right. So we have a, a, in a again Purdue University vet program is probably one of the highest ranked vet programs in the country. Yes. So by, by and that's separate from what we're talking about here, but it's just to, just to be noted. Yes, sir. So that, that the access is that going to be. Is that going to be an issue then? Are, I mean, are you not going to be able to, you're not going to be able to share any we, of those? My, myself and my staff member who are going to be reviewing the standards, we did have to sign a seven-page non-disclosure agreement and send back. And when we review it, we can't take photographs or get copies. We can only paraphrase what we review, but we are not allowed to basically reproduce what we see. So you can paraphrase what you read, and you can give opinions about we can what give, you read. We can give opinions based on what we read, yes. Okay. But we so, cannot give you a copy or write it down and, and provide that with you. You will not be allowed to leave until we get your opinion <laughs> about those. <laughs> I will I, do my I, best. I, I want to make sure that your opinions, because I do yeah. respect you from a professional standpoint, but also your personal views on mm -hmm. things. I think it's important that we get your, your feelings about that, even though you can't go verbatim on what, right. what's in there. So we're, we're very interested to read and see what these standards are because we don't really have any idea at this point. Paraphrasing, thank you. Commissioner Latwell. So I was, um, Oh wait, we were we're, not, talking, we're, not, we're not done, we're not oh, done. Oh, sorry. Uh, going back up to the 18 uh, animal welfare complaints and yes, the sir. eight citations that y'all have issued, was that in 2023? That was all in 2023, yes sir. Okay, thank you. And the reason we only did 2023, we started this new ordinance mid-year 2022. So 2023 is the first full calendar year where we have any data since we've changed ordinances. Um, as far as consumer protection goes, that is in lending practices with the stores. Commissioner Eggers and I have talked a great deal about it. And I've got some bullets on here. And Doug Templeton with Consumer Protection is going to come up and speak to you about that part because that is outside of my purview and falls more in line with, with Doug. He's, and, I'll, and I'll be back up after he gets through. Um, okay, go let, me, let me. Yes, Go ahead, Commissioner Fox. So when you gave the information as it relates to the number of people that were coming into our county to purchase animals. Yes, ma'am. Um... I'm just curious, you probably don't even know the answer to this. I'm just curious, what, why would they come into our county just because, to purchase when they can Because a lot of jurisdictions no longer have retail pet stores. Okay. Okay. And there are some of these animals that are sold out of state in states where there are no retail pet stores. Because one of the concerns, if I recall from an email, was persons were uh, traveling to go to breeders to purchase the animals. Those, that's also a legitimate option. And the, yes, um, but they also were still having issues with medical issues with the animal they purchased from a breeder. I think Commissioner Seal, yes. if I recall, gave her testament to where she went, purchased from what she thought was a certified authorized breeder and how much money she had to pay because the the, the puppy ended up being very, 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 very sick. Yes, ma'am. So, okay. That is correct. Thank you. That's why I wanted yes. you to. Okay. Good morning, Doug Templeton with Consumer Protection. Uh, we have conducted initial research surrounding uh, pet financing and current protections that are in place um, and found that all six stores in Pinellas County do offer financing uh, through a number of third-party lenders to purchase a pet. 
Consumer protections received nine complaints related to retail pet stores in the last five years. Um, however, those really related to the health of the animal and not necessarily the interest rate uh, that was being charged. Consumer advocacy groups have raised concerns that some of these lenders may offer predatory loans at rates much higher than what Florida law allows. The way they're able to do this is by utilizing certain federally regulated banks uh, to initially fund the loans who aren't subject to the state's usury laws. This sometimes is known as rent, rent a bank. Um, there's a handful of banks and lenders out there um, that are, are conducting these practices. Regarding state level regulations, uh, Florida does have a law that provides certain protections for consumers when purchasing a pet. Uh, it's commonly referred to as the pet lemon law. Dealers are required to provide a written notice at the time of sale advising consumers of their rights. Uh, this includes a certificate of veterinary inspection which lists out all the vaccines and uh, medications that have been <coughs> administered and states that the animal has been examined by a Florida licensed veterinarian uh, who certifies to the best of their knowledge at the time of the examination the animal was healthy. In the event the animal is certified to have been unfit at the time of purchase by a veterinarian, the consumer must notify the pet dealer within two business days. Uh, the consumer has the right to retain, return, or exchange the animal and receive reimbursement for certain uh, vet-related expenses, and that's subject to the right of a dealer to have the animal examined by a veterinarian of their choice. Regarding regulation, uh, the Florida Office of Financial Regulation provides oversight and licenses finance companies in Florida, investigates allegations of predatory lending. Uh, the Bureau of Enforcement there can take action if a potential lending violation is identified, encourages consumers to file complaints with them directly, as they would have reviewed these agreements between these banks and uh, lenders uh, for compliance, including those who may be utilizing that loophole. As for the out-of-state banks that participate in these practices, the FDIC has been urged by consumer advocacy groups to hold those banks accountable for the impact that their lending has to consumers. The FDIC has taken action by downgrading the performance rating on some of these banks that are facilitating these predatory loans. I think it's important to, to note that the, these third-party finance agreements aren't just limited to pets. Uh, they do cross numerous industries, including auto repair, home improvement, uh, home furnishings, appliances, as well as uh, jewelry purchases. So while we know these lenders are operating in Florida, uh, as well as Pinellas County, uh, consumer protection has not seen a pattern in the complaints in any of these areas alleging high interest rates at this time. Um, but of course, if that changes, we would certainly work with our partners at OFR to ensure that these uh, concerns are addressed. He was, he was no, first. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, I don't know if we have the ability to do anything or think about it, but a dog may not get sick in two days, two business days for you to be able to determine that you have a unfit pet. Um, you know, we sometimes we could have a cold and it not manifest itself outwardly until, you know, three, four days. So that's a concern, you know, because the pet may not be sick, they may not exhibit illnesses. Um, we probably, I don't know if we could do anything about that, but I'm just saying. Um, and then uh, you hit the nail on the head when you talk about predatory lending. We have that in all aspects for persons whose credit rating, for whatever reason, um, or someone who just doesn't have any credit because they've never utilized credit before. And so they're looking to other lenders. Other than an education component piece, you know, if they can come in under a federal uh, guise versus state, is really nothing we can do. That's up to the person who's utilizing that resource because they want this $5,000 dog that they otherwise could not afford. But I am concerned about that two-day thing because pets may not manifest that illness in two days. And I, we kind of both have responsibility for dealing with the 14-day window through the Lemon Law. And I did talked to Commissioner Eggers and I've talked about lengthening that 14 days and I did check with our county attorney's office on opinions on lengthening that 14 day window that's already established by the pet lemon law. And there is some concern about um, preemption issues because it's already established in the state statute. Right. Uh, that, there's concern that we don't have the ability to lengthen that window. To, pro to provide clarification too on the two days, that is part of the state statute requirement that the disclosure that's required to be provided the amount of time that you have, if the pet has a um, 
contagious or infectious disease, you have 14 days to where once you purchase the pet, you take it to your vet because it's sick. You would have 14 days window to for a contagious or infectious disease concern to take it to your vet. Once your vet certifies in writing that the pet was unfit at the time of sale, that's when the two days kicks in to notify the pet dealer. So it is okay. a 14-day window. Thank you. Sorry. If it's a congenital or hereditary disorder, they have a year, up to a year, to take that to the vet, get that certified, and then take that back to the dealer. Thank you. Commissioner Eggers. Um, yeah, not, not quite sure where to begin, and I don't want to get too, too uh, off, off, beat, off the path here, but um, so... Um, you mentioned the two days that there was a confusion for me and two days or 14 days or a year and uh, it doesn't need to be in fine print on a piece of paper that gets filed away. That Again, we're not talking today, we're not talking about closing stores down. What we're just talking about is what's, what the practices are out there and how we increase or improve the standards at these stores. Um, you know, you're in a transparent business, you're in, you, you're, uh, you know, you, you would, that's something that should be just a natural process to the state rules and state laws and all that stuff. You want to hide behind them, you can hide behind them, but we don't have to leave stores open either. So what I'm saying is, is that maybe there's pieces in there that we can talk about state statute related, voluntary processes, et cetera, because at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do. Um, some of these interest rates, you know, it, it, we even we even hear it in other other areas that we're dealing with it. You know, you, you, it costs this much money to buy the animal. It costs this much money if you include all the interest over the period of time. Um, but when somebody's buying it and they say, "Well, you can pay me six thousand dollars now, or pay me a couple hundred dollars a month for five years," they go, "Oh gosh, I can afford the two hundred." Not, not necessarily realizing that they're hit, getting hit with 200% interest or whatever the outrageous interest is. We have made it our business at this county not to allow PACE programs in here because residents beware. There's issues associated with that industry we're just trying to protect. And so there's no reason that we can't do the same here to protect our residents against this kind of activity. It strikes me that the bank, the buyer, and the store are like this when the, when the sale happens. But once that sale happens, it's totally, the, the, the store goes over here, the bank goes over here, and the resident's on its way, getting a real emotional attachment to this, to this new, new pet. And it attaches pretty quickly if anybody owns dogs. Um, <laughs> it doesn't happen in a day, maybe. Well, maybe it happens in an hour. I picked that dog, we looked at each other, that's our baby. Um, and then two weeks later, something happens. And now you're stuck, right? So you have those three options, you said. I think you can get full reimbursement of expenses. That doesn't mean you have to give the dog up, right? It's, it's one of the options. You could retain the pet and receive some uh, vet costs reimbursed to you, refund or... I thought it was 100%. To get the, I believe the cost of the pet, in addition to that, you would have the additional vet reimbursement costs up to the value of the pet, too. That doesn't mean you have to give up the pet. Yeah. Okay, so you have two weeks. But you also said something about the store has to provide veterinary services before the sale, before the sale occurs, and I understand that that has to happen within 30 days of the store getting the dog. The, the dog, every dog sold has to have a current OCVI, which is basically the health certificate of recording the vaccines and what has been going on, any known illnesses or issues with the dog. That comes with it from wherever it comes from. It has to have it when it comes into the state. Those are only good for 30 days. So if the dog comes in and then that OCVI is going to expire on day 10, the local pet store then has their veterinarian come in to do an updated OCVI or if there's anything else done. So that has that health certificate is going to be updated periodically as the dog stays in residence with the store. But there could be a potential that the dog is sold and not gotten that local. Yes, it, if it's sold quickly, yeah. then it's going to go home basically probably some of the time with that initial OCVI from the out-of-state veterinarian. Again, notice to people that are coming in and buying a store. There's no reason we can't have a, a sign in the store, in the middle of a store saying, please, Within, you know, get your vet checked, or get your get your dog checked by a vet immediately. <laughs> so, 
Well, you probably get your vet checked too in some cases, <laughs> um, especially the ones where they the uh, the uh, where they originate from. Uh, I'd be curious to see. But it seems to me that whether these Kate these crates that these dogs are sitting in need a lot of like identifiers, like you know a place for. Purdue certification, and we're going to assume that it's a good certification for now, people. But Purdue certification or some kind of certification that is blank unless it's certified. So it's showing that there is no certification. Uh, vet certified at its original place and a local vet certification. And all of that, all of that OCVI information is on the cage and or available for the consumer, and they do get a copy of that when it goes home, and we do get a copy of it when it's sold. So it is on the cage. Yes. That if, there's, if there is no certification, there is a thing there that's not checked, but it says certified, and if we, checked. And if we do update the ordinances with a requirement like that, that would okay. be, but that's uh, not a part of the current requirement. I understand, and I think that's the point that I'm trying to make. When people go in to buy, they see a certification there this, this dog's not certified under the Purdue standards, and I'm just making right. Purdue standards. That's all. The vet was checked before it left, and here's the, here's the contact information, the license of that, of that vet. It has not been checked locally because it's within the 30-day window, or check. It has been checked because it's beyond 30. There's no, there's no reason why a lot of that identification can't be put on these gauges so that so that or crates, so that the residents can see what's maybe should be there or maybe what isn't there. Yes. I think it's I think it's fair, and the more that we open that up to transparency for our residents, shouldn't be a bad thing. It should be a good thing, and I would think that probably even if we make those requirements, the the, the store owners would probably say that's great, and go right along with it. Um, um, anyway, that's it for now. I'll, I'll come back. Commissioner Long. Oh, okay. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Commissioner Justice. Thank you. Um, we've talked a lot about the, the lemon law, the return policies and the, that window, the, and usually it's for the health of the animal. But a lot of what we heard was that we wanted to keep, a couple years ago when we talked about the stores, was that there were folks that wanted breed-specific dogs and this was you know, a way of attaining them. Is that policy get into it at all when uh, the breed that they think they've bought is not really the breed they got? Mm -hmm. Under part of the lemon law, there is a part, section of the lemon law that if a dog is sold with a certain breed and then it is not that certain breed, the store can be held responsible. There was a case recently, these folks bought a dog and according to the paperwork they bought, it was a specific mixed breed dog. They had a DNA test run on it, it was a different set of mixed breed and so they did get partial compensation back from that pet store under the law because of that mis misbreed and what was the process because it seemed like they they didn't get a lot of response until the local news station got involved to cover the story the press i mean the press the press was involved and the process is not always simple or easy and a lot of it depends on both the consumer and the store and their um communication as well so it's it can be a difficult process or it can be an easy process and and, and quite frankly the the DNA process is not hundred uh, percent certified as the local TV station did a test on several dogs and and a test on the reporter and the reporter came back 10% French Bulldog um, so uh, it's, it's on their website if you get a chance to look at it but uh, uh, anyway thank you Doug and, and let me say that for those of us who've been on the Commission for a long time remember uh, before you came that uh, your office was kind of a revolving door um, yes, and you brought a lot of stability and competency and, and professionalism. And, and I just want to say before you uh, head on, we really appreciate your service. Thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate that. Yeah, We're going to miss you. Thank you. Um, moving on to next steps. <laughs> Lourdes will be heading this up. <laughs> 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 we do have, um, we are working on some recommendations internally within our department for improving some of the pet store standards. Um, we're looking at some improvements to the housing and kennel um, standards for, that the dogs reside in. We're looking at possibly, we were looking at some, looking at some stricter warranty or exam requirements, but as I said earlier, 
after talking with the county attorney's office, there's some interstate commerce restrictions and some preemption restrictions which make those not tenable at this point. Um, we are looking at some improved enforcement options, possibly strengthening some um, s permit suspension and revocation provisions um, for the stores who are not necessarily acting in good faith. Um, we want to do some additional reporting and data gathering on the puppies where they're ordered, how many are ordered, when they're received, what their um, condition is at receipt, if any of them are deceased, why are they deceased, and the outcomes. Things like that which we don't get data on currently. Um, we also, if it goes down that road and the commission desires, we can add in if the canine care program is something that wants to be added as a requirement, the state of Indiana has just done this, requiring that their breeders in their state are going to be required to participate in a science-based canine care type program, be that from Purdue or another type of program. Um, and there's going to be probably a several year phase in on that because of the volume of breeders. So that is, a res that is an additional provision that could possibly be, ad be added on as a sourcing requirement. Um, and also possibly adding a buyer education program requirement on as well. So those are all things we're already looking at and, we're, and trying to flesh out. Once we've reviewed, reviewed the standards with Purdue and we will follow up with the board, um, we can do one-on-ones to kind of get some consensus on the direction. And then if we do want to update ordinance language, we can then take that draft language. We obviously want to have some community stakeholder meetings and make sure we've got kind of an even-handed um, set of feedback on those draft language before we bring them to a board meeting get all that vetted, and then bring it back to the board to see where, where we go from there. Any additional questions? Dave. Um, I wanted to echo Charlie's comments, uh, Commissioner Justice's comments about your service here. I appreciate that. And, um, it's been a pleasure serving I, the, the, all of y'all. Yeah, the, uh, the folks that, uh, that I would say that are just pet-loving animals that sometimes get branded with being terrible activists. Um, I've been they're branded just, that myself a few times. Yeah, and we all are to have a little of that activist in us. <laughs> but, uh, they have speak highly of you as well. And Thanks, I sir. That, that's a testament to your professionalism. doesn't mean you haven't made mistakes or like oh, the rest of us here. Absolutely. Mistake, but I really appreciate uh, <laughs> all that you've done. I think we need to uh, definitely ramp up even further on our website, the educational program. Our partners, I call them our partners, our store owners, have to make that connection yes, sir. to those uh, abilities, and it needs to be on a really nice posted sign, on you know, in the middle of the store when the, the people are just looking at dogs and walking around, and they see the Pinellas County website for more educational issues. I think that's really important. Yes, sir. Um, but I'll, but I, but to to, to your point, you, you're talking about a lot of things there, and I'm not sure when your what your last day is here, so. I want to make sure that you, f you, you focus on those standards of, uh, from Purdue University and yes, give us your opinion on that. I'd also like to get your opinion before you leave uh, about the state of our local partners. Um, we have many, many local partners here in the, in the, in the business of, of animals, uh, giving animals to different, you know, different outlets to purchasing animals. And yes, sir. We've had a, a, a number of issues raised with one of those partners uh, because of the partnership with one of the pet stores, et cetera, and it just kind of blew up. And, but going forward, those partnerships are all very important, mm -hmm. not only to understand what they do, who they are, the transparency of their organization, and the relationships that we have with them. Yes, sir. Because um, we, when we have a relationship with a partner, we're almost putting a, like a stamp of approval on them, and so we just have to make sure that that <coughs> stamp is, is a good one. So and I, I know you're not going to be here for, for, for that much longer. Yes, sir. But I do think it's important that the state of the industry with our partners, just give us a, some thoughts on it and where maybe what we need to be doing to ramp that up a little bit. Um, well, we have, we have a number of partners in the county. We have five other shelters, all nonprofit, um, along with hundreds of rescues and, and um, both home-based, some that are out of county, some that are out of state. We do a lot of partnership dealings to get good outcomes for the animals that come through our shelter and into our county. Um, all of the shelters and all the partners that we work with all have their niche and they all have a function and are complementary to us at some point. 
they all have their issues and they all have their um, negatives just like our organization does. Um, but overall, this, the animal welfare community in this county is working really, really well. Um, all the shelter directors, and I, and I know one of them is here right now, we've had this conversation. The, we don't all see eye to eye. We all disagree on a lot of things. But at the end of the day, and I told them all this several years ago, at the end of the day, even if you all don't get along and we don't all agree with each other, if there is an issue that affects the entire county and animal services needs you to step up and get in line with us, traditionally they have always, we've worked through the differences and been able to all speak as one on a, a major issue. And so I'm hoping that after I leave that whoever takes my place will be able to continue that type of relationship with all of our partners. Yeah, I think it's gonna be really important. Um, that, you know, there's certain responsibilities that each of them have, it's SPCA being one of them, that we wanna make sure that they continue doing what they're supposed to be doing in terms of, of um, keeping the care of the animals that they get and not, uh, not recategorizing them based on technicalities, um, of whether they should be uh, euthanized or not euthanized. Uh, and uh, I think there's a lot of things that we just have to make sure, the neutering process, the, you know, the, that's, that's, a, that, that's an expensive process for somebody to have to go through. There's supposed to be some assistance in that area, and we've got to make sure that that continues. But I did want to say one other thing. Yes, sir. The, the, the business owners that are here, we're all business folks, and we like to make sure that businesses have a chance to do well in this county. Um, but we have a standard, and um, you know, the sheriff department provides services, and they have a standard themselves of excellence, mm -hmm. and we demand that of them. And so yes. we're, there's no, we want to demand the excellence here. The county attorney is going to keep us in that legal lane. Yes, sir. But at the same time, there's some things that we can do that, that it's basically voluntary cooperation from these partners, these six retail stores that can occur as well. Because again, we're talking about doing a service for our residents, mm -hmm. the ones who are buying these animals. So it doesn't have to be you know, legally defensible to say, step it up <laughs> and do things that are right. And so that partnership is, it, it, that, the ability to stay in business in this county is predicated on that in my opinion. And so we need to make sure that we're doing all that we can and understand those limits, as the county attorney tells us, but also understand doing the right thing. Um, I have complete faith that, because um, my field enforcement manager who's in charge of the enforcement division is here so that he can be hear the conversation firsthand. I give you my assurance that he and his folks are going to be fully supportive of my successor to continue to get these standards where they need to be. Well, I certainly hope that your successor um, is, is open as you were with me in one-on-one -on -one and is as candid. But you need to bring personal opinions to this job and you also need to stay within the confines of, uh, we understand that, you know, <laughs> the, the, the chain of command, so to speak. Yes, sir. But at the end of the day, the residents are at the top of that chain and we're right below them and then you've got Barry, and then you've got the rest of you. So there's a lot of people up there that are, that are in that chain of command that need to be listened to as well. And I'm going to require that, if you will, of, the, of your successor. I think that's fine. I really appreciate, again, what, all that you've done. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Madam. Commissioner Long. I'll be very brief. Doug, I just want you to leave here knowing that you can leave and be very proud of the work yeah. that you have done in your department. I have found your demeanor and your character above reproach, and it's your ability to collaborate and form these relationships that have enabled us to do all the great things we've done on this issue. As you know, it can be a very emotional one, and people get very upset about the, the issues we're talking about today, but I am very, very thrilled with the way you have handled it all, and I wish you nothing but the best going forward. Thank you. Good luck to you. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Well, I echo those comments, and now uh, you are gonna be missed. And, um, and as Commissioner Egger said, I, you know, there's, there's a couple of the store owners that are willing to step up and really be that um, uh, champion for transparency and, and health and welfare. So uh, I'm pleased that we have you know, those partners as well. So um, 
but you are really going to be missed. And uh, I look forward to hearing the report after your meeting with um, yes, ma Purdue. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And, uh, and will you, like, leave your contacts so we can reach out to you? Because <laughs> everybody will still have questions. my cell phone number. I may need some opinions from you. So it's I, not changing. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. All right. We can take a few minutes before we go. Uh, yes. I, I, are you all up for a few minute break? Sure. Come back in 15 minutes if that's okay. So at 12:20 we'll be back and do the agenda review.
under presentations, you got recognition of Gibbs High School basketball team. I think Commissioner Flowers might have something to say about that um, and others, but um, you got Autism Awareness Month, um, Joint Earth Day, uh, Arbor Day Proclamation, and Public Service Recognition Week Proclamation. Uh, and then your partner presentation um, was Keep Vanellis Beautiful. So, um, you've got um, items on the consent, vouchers, receipt for filings, um, things like that. So I'll move down unless there's questions to item number 18. Um, this is uh, a, just a delegated item report. Item 19 is a joint funding agreement with USG uh, Geological Survey. Uh, this gathers all of our data that we use for flood stages and everything, and so you can see the costs associated. This is a continuation of things we've done in the past. Item 20 is a ratification of uh, revisions made to a grant. Uh, this We anticipated the county match, um, and so this, trying to read back of what I remember <laughs> out of this. And what was the revision? Okay, so the, the granting agency uh, gave us more money, and so we had to modify uh, the program to um, account for that. Um, item 21 is um, county attorney. Nothing. There, there's just one case on there. Uh, it's dog bite case. <laughs> Others received for filing. Item 24. This is a third amendment to an agreement with Yellowstone Landscaping. This just adds two locations. Um, so we're constantly moving these around based upon people's ability to perform. Um, it's within budget. Um, item 25 is rank and affirms with flagship aviation services. This is for janitorial services at the airport. Item 26 is the demolition of vacant property. Uh, this is a code enforcement issue. Question? Madam, thank you, Madam Chair. So that... Uh, when we demolish it, the property still belongs to the. We haven't we haven't taken the property, but there's we're going to seek to get the money for the demolition from the property owner to where, at some point, if they don't pay that, we could claim the property. Typically, what we do is it's imposed as a lien against the property. Correct. Um, assuming I don't, I don't know if it's a homesteaded property or non-homesteaded property. If it's non-homesteaded, we could foreclose on it. Um, I think the code enforcement has some standards and like it's a, a some it's things. a lien foreclosure process, and so we we the cost of the demolition is tagged to the lien, and so that's typically how we recoup it. But just having that property uh, vacant will be an improvement to the neighborhood. It, exactly. And so this way, you know, you've got an unsafe structure. You don't have squatters, things like that. So you deal with that and then get your money on the back end through the lien. Item 27, this is acceptance of a burn memorial um, grant. So uh, the breakdowns within your packet, we get this funding in, we share it with our partners. Um, you can see the the biggest one, you know, the biggest one are the different agreements that we have through human services. Item 28, First Amendment to an agreement with Aptum uh, for coastal management. This agreement adds um, one and one million dollars. Uh, this is for funding uh, for the Adelia storm response to the dunes. You're going to see a lot more, and we're going to have a lot of discussion coming up at the T the joint TDC BCC meeting regarding dunes and beaches and things like that. So. Um, and if that's not been on your calendar, that's May second. Yeah. Just to be sure, all of you have that on it, your calendar. It is, yes, May second, and remember, it's at the Sheridan Sand Key. Thank you. Uh, item 29, Florida Shared Use um, Motorized Non-Motorized non Trail Network Agreement. Um, this is for uh, Pinella Loop Phase 4. So this is one of your final remaining uh, segments of the trail to be completed. And this is an agreement with FDOT. What do you mean non-motorized trail? <laughs> you mean the that's, same way? That's, that's the way they classify it. Uh, don't don't so, don't shoot the messenger. Uh, well, that's what happens sometimes. <laughs> so it's like the rest of the non-motorized trail that we're talking about. Correct. And we're in sync with the rest. I should have just said the Fred Marquis Trail. Right. Um, <laughs> okay. Thank you. 
Um, item 30 is hazard mitigation grant program, grant agreement um, uh, with the uh, Florida Department of Emergency Management for the acquisition of repetitive uh, flood loss properties. Anything to report on that, Jill? So, okay. Okay, so again, that, that's a grant. Um, item 31, specific purpose survey for maintained right-of-ways. Um, this is 46th Avenue from 49th Street to north to Joe's Creek. I think you were briefed individually on that. Um, item 32 is a state and um, local uh, fiscal recovery uh, funds reporting requirement. Um, so again, this is to comply uh, with federal requirements for reporting. Um, this is um, with Florida Environmental Protection for the Deneen Causeway Resiliency Act and adaptation. Item 33 is the Third Amendment with Motorola uh, for public safety communications. Um, this is their, their um, ongoing um, contract for all their different equipment and radios. Item 34 is amendment number three to an agreement with advanced disposal uh, for the operation of Bridgeway Acres. Okay. So this is our outsourced um, portion of the landfill. The trip trailer services. You want to hear she more doesn't on that? have a microphone, you want to repeat that? Come on up and explain. This is, this is a specific piece of the operation, um, and it's specifically around the tip trailers, but she can explain it better. Good afternoon, Jill Solarboard, County Admin. Uh, yeah, so this amendment actually is to have our Bridgeway Acres operator provide tip trailer services, which we are implementing in order to reduce the number of backups that are currently occurring uh, from the scales to the disposal. So this will be an intermediary place to take some of that and then the trailers get pulled up at lower lower uh, volume times and and tipped. It's 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 just a it's basically putting in a, a middle uh, receiving they don't have people up at the waste energy facility. That's correct. I, I think that's good because I've been out there to take stuff, you know, like when I've cleaned up my garage and stuff, and it is <laughs> busy. Yeah, so I think that'll be good. Yeah, it hopefully makes it more efficient. Item 35 is a um, non-medical uh, wheelchair transport. Um, so first choice trans, county attorney. Under item 36, um, we would normally have sent a confidential memo around for you all to review today. Um, however, given some of the timing issues on that case, we do not yet have a recommendation for you. We will prior to the meeting on Tuesday, so I'll reach out to each of you uh, prior to that time to let you know what that recommendation is and, and discuss the case with you. Um, and on 37, I do anticipate um, asking you all to vote on a matter that I've discussed with each of you, and this is related to um, a request for an attorney general's opinion that has been submitted. We were contacted by the attorney general and asked if we would like to weigh in on that issue. Uh, in order for us to do so, we need for the Board of County Commissioners to take a vote so that we can forward those minutes to the attorney general. Uh, so I am gonna ask you all to vote on that matter under um, county attorney reports. And if any of you need a refresher on what the issue is, I can talk to you when I give you a call to talk to you about the confidential memo. Thirty-eight to county minister's report. I'll have a report. Uh, Thirty-nine are appointments to the unincorporated Seminole Sports Association. So you've got two groupings there: the four citizens and the three different sports associations. And then county commission new business. On to the back. You got several public hearings. The first one is the second public hearing. This is all of this is our zoning code changes that you. Um, been briefed on. Good. Item number 34 is the companion to that on um, oh, second public hearing, and this is the stormwater manual. Item 33 is a um, ordinance enabling the county to impose and collect an annual non-ad valorem special assessment levied solely on the properties owned and leased by hospitals 
This is the hospital direct payment program that you've heard about for several years. They all had to agree. They finally agreed. Um, and so this enables them to collect more money through that program. And we have two human services folks here, well, one former and one current that can answer your questions if you have. All right, and that concludes the agenda. Okay, Commissioner Eggers. Number 33, I don't want to get into it today. I haven't looked at the background material yet, but if we'll have somebody here that can speak to that Motorola contract, the Motorola Solutions Third Amendment. Sure, Th yeah, this is, um, yeah, we, I can speak to it. I mean, this, this is our ongoing um, so Motorola contract. But so it's within a five-year period, so it was $2.7 million for the five years, and now it's going up $3 million. I just... Well, it's an it's a second amendment, so it adds to the amount, correct? Yeah, so it, that's cumulative. So it's 2.7 and an additional three. So it's really over the next period that makes it a 5.7 million. But you're going from 2.7 to 3 million is what you're you're seeing. What's that? I'm say that again. You're really going from 2.7 million to 3 million over because 2.7 million was the first. This amendment adds an additional 3 million. So your comparison is 2. Point yeah, but it's still, it's still from the same period, 22 through 26, right? The original contract yes. was in 22, so it's still only a four-year period. And, and we need to add additional amounts because we utilize the first contract. That's what I just want to understand more, yeah. so just... Okay. okay, so we can talk offline on that. Thank you. Yeah, and just so, so you know, while we're talking about that, I did ask staff to go back and look. Um, to make sure that we're right-sizing our radios and only using them because these are expensive radios where we need them, you know. Um, you don't need them everywhere. People can use their cell phone, you know, or whatever. And so we are trying to put standards in to make sure we're using the minimum necessary to do the job that they need. Any other comments or questions? Okay. So I mentioned to you that um, I wanted the commissioners, if you haven't been chair, you really don't get in the nitty gritty of Visit St. Pete Clearwater and how that works. And so I do have some proposed sales missions and auto market activations and trade show opportunities for each of you. Uh, one of them is coming up in May. I have an option for everyone to have one. So there's seven opportunities. Um, I have six of the seven, two of them are Brian and I already taken. So I'm waiting on one more, but I'm gonna send this out early. I don't have the other one, but there's one May 3rd. Uh, which is U.S. Travel IPW. It's Leisure Travel and PR Trade in Los Angeles, California. Uh, another one in June, another one in July. So I definitely want to get this out to you this week. Uh, hopefully Brian will have that other one. The reason I'm adding one is he put the Visit Florida Governor's Conference, which is in Tampa. And I think that anybody that might want to go to that, since it's in Tampa, would have the opportunity to go to it. So I didn't want that to be one of the options. I wanted to have an opportunity where you can really see what these missions are about. Um, so I'll get that out to you this week. Hopefully I'll have that last one from Brian this week. Um, and then I need you to get back to me on which ones, and only one person can go on each one of the trips. So it's gonna have to be kind of first come, first serve who picks whichever one those are gonna be. Okay, so I will be sending those out this week um, and get back to me as quickly as you can. Um, and I think it's a great opportunity for us to see how that arm of the county works. Um, good, bad, or indifferent. And if it turns out to not be a good mission, then it's a great learning experience as well. Because um, there's always uh, lessons learned on failures too, so or some that aren't as great. So we'll get that out to you this week. Again, respond to me really quickly. And, um, and I hope that uh, you enjoy the experience. Um, and that's all I have, so if there's nothing else, Commissioner of Justice. Thank you, oh, ma'am. cereal, right? We yes, ma'am. Um, one, thank you for your uh, donation. Uh, the chair has set the bar uh, oh. for the amount of cereal, so uh, a lot of us have uh, need to, to reach that. <laughs> yes. And, uh, and uh, so, any, if you can hear my voice, uh, we're collecting cereal on the fifth floor of the commission office. If you drop off uh, or if you want to drop cash to me, um, I'll try and keep track of it. Um, but uh, we're collecting cereal up until uh, next Wednesday in our office. We had planned to collect during our work session here, but then we're, we're having our work session out on the beach, so we won't be able to do that. But anytime between now and Wednesday the 1st, uh, if you drop off in our office, we'll make sure that it gets to the massive collection that they're doing on that Friday for uh, Pinellas County. So appreciate your support.
Great, and thanks for doing that and heading that up. I appreciate it. And Commissioner Flowers. Um, just wanted to share that um, um, Pinellas County will be receiving an award at the Resiliency Summit. Yep. Um, and it's due to all of the hard work that um, we have done when it comes to evacuations um, during the hurricane season. So even if you're not able to make it to the Resiliency Summit, if you are able to just um, attend the luncheon so that you can be there to help receive the award. I have Darlena sending it to everybody, but just wanted to share that um, with you guys. It's on the last day of the conference for luncheon. So just nice to be honored okay. for the work y'all are doing, everybody's doing. Anyone else have Commissioner Long? Uh, yes, I wanted to share with everyone that the future of the Regents Award are, they're also recognizing uh, mental health for heroes. Yes. And I'm extremely proud of that. And uh, I hope you all keep my daughter-in-law, Kathy, in your prayers. Mm -hmm. She's very ill. We will keep her in our prayers. Thank you. Any other comments? OK, I want to also thank our deputies that are here, Deputy Butterfield and Deputy Burgos. Thank you always for your service and always being here for us. We appreciate it. Okay, with that, meeting's adjourned.